It's hard to deny that every question holds an opportunity for growth, and we need to approach each one with curiosity and determination, knowing that each attempt brings you closer to mastery. You're presented with three cool-looking shapes. Each shape has seven numbers inside. The first shape has numbers 8, 7, 2, 5, 6, 9, and then number 5 in the middle. The second shape has numbers 3, 4, 7, 8, 1, 6, and then number 7 in the middle. The third shape has numbers 0, 3, 9, 6, 2, 5, and then in the middle comes the missing number, which you need to calculate and select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 0. Choice B, 1. Choice C, 2. And last but not least, choice D, 3. If you are like me, you might have doubts about this question. But don't worry, it's totally natural to encounter challenges. Remember though, every problem has a solution, and I believe you will find it with your ingenuity and perseverance. Let's tackle it as a team. Are you prepared to showcase your response? Let's start the discussion and see where it leads us. And if uncertainty lingers, stay motivated. Every effort made, whether successful or not, brings valuable insights and opportunities for improvement. As you might have guessed, to calculate the number, we need to detect the pattern. And pattern here is simple, but not very obvious. The pattern is that the sum of all inside numbers minus the sum of the outside numbers calculates the middle number. Let's look at the example. In the first shape, the inside numbers are 5, 7, and 9. And the sum of 5, 7, and 9 minus the sum of 2, 6, and 8 equals 5. Let's confirm our calculations by looking at the second shape. 6 plus 4 plus 8 minus 1 plus 3 plus 7 equals 7. And now we can calculate the missing number. 5 plus 3 plus 6 minus 2 plus 0 plus 9 equals 3. So the correct answer here is choice D, 3. It might come to you as a surprise what Winston Churchill once said. Success is not final. Failure is not final. It's the courage to continue that counts. Same way is you have the power to persevere through any challenge, including this question. The key is not to give up, but keep trying. You are presented with the square, which has 16 numbers inside, and one number is missing. The numbers are starting from the upper left corner, 3, 9, 2, and 4 in the first row, 4, 7, 2, and 2 in the second row, 5, 7, 2, and 4 in the third row, and then the last row contains numbers 6, 8, 2, and then comes the missing number, which you need to calculate and select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 2, choice B, 4, choice C, 6, and choice D, 8. Are you finding this question tricky? Well, that's the sign you are stretching your problem-solving muscles. Embrace the challenge, think creatively, and let's work through this together. I know you've got what it takes. Are you excited to share your solution? Let's roll up our sleeves and begin the comparison. Remember though, even if uncertainty looms, keep your optimism shining. Every challenge encountered, whether conquered or not, fosters growth and resilience. The pattern here is rather simple. The last two digits in each row are equal to the sum of the first two digits multiplied by 2. Let's look at the example. The first row has numbers 3, 9, 2, and 4. 3 plus 9 equals 12, multiplied by 2 equals 24. Let's look at the other rows. 4 plus 7 multiplied by 2 equals 11 multiplied by 2 and equals 22. 5 plus 7 multiplied by 2 equals 24. And then the last row where we calculate the missing number where 6 plus 8 multiplied by 2 equals 28. So the correct answer here is choice D, 8. You can't argue, but with this question, you're not just the participant. You are a maestro leading the orchestra of your own potential. Let your brilliance resonate in your answer as well to help you accomplish your goals on your journey. You are presented with 3x3 three three square. Each cell in the square has a number. The numbers starting with the first column are 57, 89, and 99. The middle column has numbers 12, 17, and 18. 
and then the last column has numbers 3, 8, and then comes the missing number, which you need to calculate and select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 7, choice B, 8, choice C, 9, and last but not least, choice D, 10. If you think it's a tricky question, you are not alone. I think exactly the same way. But fear not, you're in a good company here on this channel. Whether you're a seasoned problem solver or just starting out, I have confidence in your abilities. Pause for a moment, channel your inner creativity, and let's conquer this challenge side by side. Your solution is just around the corner. Are you prepared with your solution? I am curious to compare the notes, so I am moving forward so we can share our answers. If you look closely, you can easily recognize the pattern. The calculations here are organized in each row from left to right. Next number in the row is calculated as the sum of digits from the previous one. Let's look at the first row calculations. The number in the upper left corner is 57. 5 plus 7 equals 12. And 1 plus 2 equals 3. Let's look at the second row. Second row starts with the number 89. 8 plus 9 equals 17. And then 1 plus 7 equals 8. The third row starts with the number 99. 9 plus 9 equals 18. So to calculate the missing number, we need to add 1 plus 8, and the result of this is 9. So the correct answer here is choice C, 9. With this question, I want you to remember, you are not just answering it. You are embarking on the journey of discovery and growth. Let's every correct response be a milestone on your path to excellence. And let's convert every incorrect one into the lesson learned. You are presented with the circle, which is broken down into the eight equal parts. Each section in the circle has number inside. The numbers are 35, 47, 34, 37, 49, 68, 57, and then comes the missing number, which you need to calculate and select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 17. Choice B, 20. Choice C, 23. And last but not least, choice D, 25. Do you think it's a tough one? Rest assured, you are not trying to solve it alone. Regardless of your expertise in problem solving, I believe in your abilities. Pause for a moment, harness your creativity, and let's face this challenge together. The answer is just waiting you insightful touch. Are you ready to showcase your solution? Let's get into it and let's see how our answers match up. Together, we will unravel the complexities of this assessment test question. I'll ask you for a favor though, and specifically to share your thought process in comments. Your insights might hold the key for all of us to learn and improve. And even if you don't have the answer, don't get discouraged. Just like every cloud has a silver lining, every challenging question carries a lesson waiting to be discovered. You will learn and improve with each question and do better next time. If you look closely at the circle, you can recognize the pattern. The numbers on the opposite side of the left-sided numbers are calculated as a product of digits of the right-side numbers minus 1. Let's look at the example. At 11 o'clock, we see number 57. 5 multiplied by 7 minus 1 brings us to 34, which is the calculated number on the opposite side. Let's apply the same principles to calculate the other numbers. 6 multiplied by 8 minus 1 equals 47. 4 multiplied by 9 minus 1 equals 36 minus 1 and equals 35. Now we can do the missing number. 3 multiplied by 7 minus 1 equals 20. So the correct answer here is choice B, 20. With this question, I would like you to imagine yourself as a chef crafting a gourmet meal of intelligence. And the correct answer here will represent a perfectly seasoned ingredient. And the final dish is a banquet of your achievement. You're presented with three diamonds. Each diamond has four numbers inside. The first diamond has numbers one, two, three, see a pattern here? And then comes the number 14. Second diamond has numbers two, three, and four, another pattern. And then comes the number 29. The third diamond has numbers 3, 4, 5, and then comes the missing number, which you need to calculate and select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 45, 
choice B, 48, choice C, 50, and last but not least, choice D, 52. I wish I would know what your first impression is about this question. What I do know is that I don't want you to think of this as a tough challenge. I would like you instead to focus on thinking out of the box. Rest assured, you are not trying to solve this challenge alone. Regardless of your experience in problem solving, I believe in your abilities. Pause for a moment, harness your creativity, and let's face this tough challenge together. The answer is just waiting for your insightful touch. Are you ready to showcase your solution? Let's get into it and see how our answers match up. And even if you don't have the answer, don't get discouraged. Keep your spirits up, even if you're unsure. Every question, whether answered correctly or not, is a chance to gain valuable insights and refine your skills for future success. As you probably might have guessed, the first three digits in a diamond do not represent the pattern. And the pattern here is that the bottom number is calculated as a sum of other numbers squared. Let's look at the example. First diamond has numbers 1, 2, and 3, and number 14 is the result of the calculation. Let's look at the calculations. 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared equals 1 plus 4 plus 9 and equals 14. Let's do the math for the second diamond. 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 4 plus 9 plus 16 and equals 29. Now we can calculate the missing number. 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 5 squared equals 9 plus 16 plus 25 and equals 50. So the correct answer here is choice C, 50. One has to acknowledge that we need to think of this question as a friendly competition with ourselves. Every correct answer is a personal victory and you're on the track to set a new high score in the game of knowledge. In this question, you're presented with six containers. Three first containers are filled with liquid, and you need to rearrange the containers by touching only one of them. This question seems unsolvable, but hey, I believe in your abilities. Pause for a moment, harness your creativity, and let's face this challenge together. The answer is just waiting for your insightful touch. Are you ready to showcase your solution? Let's get into it and see how our answers match up. Together, we'll unravel the complexities of this assessment test question. I'll ask you for a favor though, and specifically to share your thought process in comments. Your insight might hold the key for all of us to learn and improve. And even if you didn't have the answer, don't get discouraged. Keep your spirits up even if you're unsure. Every question, whether answered correctly or not, is a chance to gain valuable insights and refine your skills for future success. Typical way of thinking to solve this question is just to move the glasses. And to move the glasses, it requires you to touch two containers. But to actually solve it, you need to think out of the box. And out of the box thinking is rather simple. You need to pour the water from one glass to another. Take the second glass from the left and pour the water into the second from the end container empty glass container and return it back, only touching one container. <laughs> when you look at this question, you have to realize that when you answer it, it would feel like adding a shining star into the constellation of your success. So keep shining bright. You're presented with octagon. It has numbers inside. There are seven numbers and the eighth number is missing. The numbers are 48, 76, 59, 98, 12, 13, 14, and then comes the missing number, which you need to select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 15. Choice B, 16. Choice C, 17. Choice D, 18. I hope you noticed there is a pattern here. Look at 12, 13, 14, or maybe not. You think it's a tricky question? Fear not. You're in a good company on this quest. Whether you're a seasonal problem solver or just starting out, I have confidence in your abilities. Pause for a moment, channel your inner creativity, and let's conquer this challenge side by side. Your solution is just around the corner. Are you prepared with your solution? I am curious to compare notes. 
So let's move forward and share our answers. To answer this question, you need to look closely to determine the pattern. And the pattern here is that starting at 8 o'clock, numbers on the opposite side of the octagon are sums of digits of the numbers from the opposite side. Let's look at the example. You see the number 48 at 8 o'clock? 4 plus 8 equals 12. And that's exactly the number on the opposite side. Let's keep looking. 76 converts into 7 plus 6 and equals 13. 59 converts to 5 plus 9 and equals 14. And then the missing number can be calculated as 9 plus 8 and equals 17. So the correct answer here is choice C, 17. <laughs> Some might argue that attempting this problem is like playing hide and seek with a ghost. It may seem elusive, but with a little persistence, you will uncover the mystery. But I see this question like a garden of opportunities. It may be a seed that, when nurtured, grows into knowledge. Your goal is to determine the opposite business word pairs. You already presented with one pair, innovative versus conventional. And you need to find the opposite business word pairs for other words, which are transparent, collaborative, strategic, and stable. Feel like you stumbled upon a tough one? Well, it's not that difficult to solve, and I have full trust in your problem-solving capabilities. Whether you're a problem-solving veteran or a newcomer, I believe in your capabilities. Take a moment to reflect, tap into your creativity, and let's tackle this challenge together. The answer is just waiting to be discovered. Are you ready with your version of the solution? I hope you are, so let's move forward and compare our versions of the answer. I think the opposite of transparent is the word opaque. Opaque in business describes the lack of transparency or clarity, whether information or processes are unclear, making it difficult for stakeholders to understand or access. The example of the sentence with the word might be, the financial report was so opaque that investors struggled to understand the company's true financial health. The opposite of the word collaborative is independent. Independent in business denotes autonomy and self-reliance, indicating the ability for the entity or individual to operate without unique influence or reliance on external factors. The example of the sentence with this word might be, the entrepreneur decided to start an independent consulting firm, free from constraints of a traditional corporate structure. The opposite of the word strategic in business is tactical. Tactical in business sense relates to actions or strategies that are carefully planned and executed to achieve short-term goals or respond to immediate challenges within an overall strategic framework. The example of the sentence was this word might be, the marketing team implemented a tactical campaign to boost sales during the holiday season, targeting specific demographics with precision. An opposite of the word stable could be volatile. Volatility in business refers to the degree of unpredictability and variability in market conditions, prices, or other factors. The example of the sentence with this word might be, the stock market became highly volatile, with prices fluctuating dramatically in response to global economic uncertainties. Did you come up with any different alternatives? If you did, please make sure to share them in comments so we can all learn. Admit it or not, but we need to consider this question as a chapter in the adventure novel of your learning journey. The more chapters you complete, the more epic your score of success becomes. You're presented with five mathematical equations. Well, those equations look unusual. The first equation is 1 plus 1 equals 13. 1 plus 2 equals 15. 2 plus 2 equals 26. 2 plus 3 equals 28. 3 plus 3 equals the missing number which you need to calculate and select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 35. Choice B, 37. Choice C, 39. And last but not least, choice D, 41. I wonder what's your first impression of this challenge? I don't want you to think of this one as a tough challenge. Rest assured, you are not trying to solve it alone. Regardless of your experience in problem solving, I believe in your abilities. Pause for a moment, harness your creativity, and let's face this challenge together. The answer is just waiting for your insightful touch. Are you ready to showcase your solution? 
let's get into it to see how our answers match up. And even if you don't have the answer, don't get discouraged. Keep your spirits up even if you're unsure. Every question, whether answered correctly or not, is a chance to gain valuable insights and refine your skills for future success. As you might have guessed, to solve these equations, you need to think out of the box and recognize the pattern. But pattern here is rather simple. To get to the final result, the traditional math here is supplemented by adding the number which is represented by a combination of two digits. Let's look at the example. The initial first equation is 1 plus 1 equals 13. But in addition to 1 plus 1 math, we need to add 11, the combination of digits 1 and 1. So the final math would be 1 plus 11 plus 1 and then the result equals 13. Let's look at other expressions to validate our assumption. 1 plus 2 equals 1 plus 12 plus 2 and equals 15. 2 plus 2 equals 2 plus 22 plus 2 and equals 26. 2 plus 3 equals 2 plus 23 plus 3 and equals 28, which allows us to calculate the missing number. 3 plus 3 equals 3 plus 33 plus 3 and equals 39. So the correct answer here is choice C, 39. In this section, we will look at the behavioral employment assessment questions frequently asked in a test. Behavioral questions are used by employers to evaluate a candidate's behavioral tendencies, soft skills, and decision-making abilities in specific work-related scenarios. These tests are designed to predict how well a candidate is likely to perform and how well the candidate will fit into company's culture based on their responses to various situational questions. Most commonly, employers use following three types of questions. Number one is scenario-based questions. Candidates are presented with hypothetical work-related scenarios or situations. The scenarios may be relevant to a specific job role or industry the candidate is applying for. Number two are multiple choice questions. Candidates are provided with multiple choice options as responses for each scenario. They need to choose the most appropriate or effective response. And last but not least are evaluation behavioral trait questions. These types of questions assess various behavioral traits and soft skills of the candidates, such as problem solving ability, communication skills, teamwork, conflict resolution, time management, adaptability, and leadership potential. Let's look at some of the specific behavioral test questions we frequently see on the test. Here's an amazing question we frequently see on the test. You're presented with the statement. In this case, the statement is, I'm working better when no one is bothering me. You need to select your answer out of seven possible choices. Choice A, strongly disagree. Choice B, disagree. Choice C, somewhat disagree. Choice D, not sure. Choice E, somewhat agree. Choice F, agree. And last but not least, choice G, strongly agree. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. This is a tricky question. So in addition to just selecting the answer, I would recommend that you build a mental strategy on how to answer and why are you selecting this particular choice. Are you ready? Let's move forward. So I'll share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Before answering this question, let's take a close look to see what employer is looking for. I believe in this particular question, employer is looking for specific qualities and skills related to teamwork and collaboration. What's interesting is while the statement, I'm working better when no one's bothering me, might reflect preference for working independently, this is not correct. The statement, if answered incorrectly, raises concerns about your ability to function effectively within the team-oriented environment. To better understand how to answer, let's imagine the scenario where you're answering this question during job interview. How would you answer? I might be wrong, but when answering, you would highlight three important points. Number one, you would highlight your collaboration skills. You would emphasize your ability to work well with others and your experiences in collaborating on projects and tasks. You probably would benefit by providing examples on how you communicate effectively, share ideas, and respect diverse opinions. Number two, you would discuss successful team experiences. 
you probably would provide examples of times when you worked effectively in a team setting and collaborating to achieving positive outcomes. And last but not least, I would recommend that you acknowledge your independence but show adaptability. While it's okay to appreciate periods of uninterrupted work, it's essential to demonstrate your adaptability to work in a team when required. Now let's summarize and look at important considerations on how you can answer these types of questions. There are a few important criteria to keep in mind. Number one is that this question measures your level of sociability. These types of questions measure your tendency to enjoy being around people and working with others. Number two is in this question, employer is trying to determine if you're a good team player. Number three, the correct answer depends on the specific job, but keep in mind that most of the jobs require interactions with other team members. So the summary here is that if your job opening requires teamwork, and most of the jobs do, it's always better to answer strongly disagree or disagree. And if you have ability to provide the rationale for your answer, make sure to use the samples that I'm just about to provide to you, as well as considerations in this note section. Let's look at the specific sample. So you presented with the question, I'm working better when no one is bothering me. Your answer might be, I respectfully disagree that I work better when no one's bothering me. In any work environment, I recognize the importance of being open to collaboration as well as team interactions. I understand that work processes can be unpredictable and that there may be situations where my coworkers require help or attention. And I'm always willing to lend a hand and actively engage with my team members to ensure our collective success. I genuinely enjoy being around people and thrive in collaborative setting. Working with others helps me leverage diverse perspectives and skill sets, which often leads to innovative solutions and improved outcomes. I strongly believe that maintaining open communications with colleagues fosters a supportive and productive work environment. What's even more important is that while I prefer to minimize unnecessary distractions and unrelated requests during my focus time, I understand that effective teamwork sometimes necessitates flexibility. In such cases, I am acceptable and capable of handling stress with composure. I have developed resilience and the ability to maintain productivity even in the demanding situations. So, ultimately, I am confident that my collaborative mindset, interpersonal skills, and capacity to handle varying work dynamics make me a strong fit for the role that requires team interactions. I am committed to contributing my best efforts to the team's success and fostering a positive and productive work environment. This is why, when I was presented with the question, I am working better when no one bothering me, I chose choices A, strongly disagree, or choice B, disagree. What are your thoughts and experiences answering this type of question? Could you please share your thought process and rationale in comments so we can all learn? We get a lot of questions on how to excel on behavioral assessment tests for employment. I believe that to succeed in behavioral tests, you must adopt a comprehensive approach that showcases authenticity, self-awareness, job relevance, a balanced perspective, as well as the art of supporting examples. Let's look at each one of them in more details. Number one is embrace authenticity. Authenticity forms the foundation of successful behavioral assessment. As a candidate, make sure to be true to yourself and present honest responses that genuinely reflect your personality, values, and work style. I recommend that you avoid the temptation of molding your answers to align with perspective expectations and instead emphasize your strengths while acknowledging areas of growth. Number two principle is cultivate self-awareness. Self-awareness is the key to understanding and articulating your behavioral tendencies. Take a moment to showcase your unique characteristics, strengths, and weaknesses. More than just understanding yourself in isolation, consider how your attributes contribute to collaborative work environment. Number three principle is tailor your responses for job relevance. To truly stand out, candidate must recognize the importance of tailoring responses for specific job requirements. Before responding to each scenario, carefully analyze the job description, responsibilities, and organizational values. Make sure to align your answers with the qualities that employer is looking for and ensure that responses resonate with their expectations. Number four is strike a balanced perspective. While emphasizing your strengths is crucial, 
avoid painting the overly one-sided picture of yourself. Make sure that you strive for the balanced perspective, which would acknowledge both your positive attributes and areas of development. And also ensure that you highlight your willingness to learn, adapt and grow. And last but not least, principle number five is elevate your responses with supporting examples. Concrete examples are the lifeblood of compelling behavioral assessment response. Instead of providing vague answers, back your choices with specific instances from the past experiences. Elaborate on how you successfully handled challenges, resolved conflicts, or contributed to the team accomplishments. And now, let's continue to get you ready for the assessment test. Here's an interesting question to see how well you would deal with customer service inquiries. A customer is upset because her favorite pizza is currently unavailable. What is the best way to respond? And you're presented with four possible choices. Choice A. Tell the customer to speak with the manager to resolve the issue. Choice B. Offer the customer an alternative pizza option. Choice C. Inform the customer that you will check if the desired pizza is in stock. And last but not least, choice D. State that handling this matter is not within your responsibility. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Are you ready? If not, please make sure to pause this video to see if you can come up with the answers, because I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to resolve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might have guessed, this question is not about picking one of the choices. This question is about a fundamental customer service principles and how you use them to answer this particular question. You also want to make sure to mention all these principles when you're answering this question in person. So what are those principles? There are four of them. Number one is acknowledging the customer's disappointment. Because her favorite pizza is not available and you show empathy, this shows your understanding of her feelings. Number two principle is providing an immediate alternative option which shows responsiveness and commitment to helping the customer promptly. Number three principle is taking responsibility for finding a solution which exemplifies ownerships and dedication for you to help resolve customer issue. And last but not least is the principle of offering an alternative. In this case, you can offer alternative pizza which would demonstrate a proactive approach to addressing the customer concern and finding a suitable resolution. Based on these four principles, let's look at the incorrect answers and why you might avoid selecting them. Choose A. Tell the customer to speak with the manager to resolve the issue. Using this selection passes the responsibility to the manager and may make customer feel ignored and dismissed. And it is important to take initiative and attempt to assist the customer directly. Choice C. Inform the customer that you will check if the desired pizza is in stock is a good choice. But this is not the best choice. While this response shows some willingness to help, it may leave the customer waiting for the solution. Offering an immediate alternative is a more proactive approach. And last incorrect choice is choice D. State that handling this matter is not within your responsibility. Telling the customer that it's not your responsibility can come across as unhelpful and may lead to further dissatisfaction. You should strive to assist the customer as much as possible within your capacity. So as you might have figured out, I believe that the correct answer to this question is choice B. Offer an alternative pizza option. By offering an alternative pizza option, you address the customer's disappointment and demonstrate willingness to help. In addition to the suggestion, you can also offer to search for her favorite pizza flavors in competitor brands. This approach helps turn a negative situation into a positive one, where you learn more about the customer and find the proactive solution as possible suitable alternative. What do you think about this question? Do you agree with this solution? Do you have a better way to solve it? Please make sure to post your answer and rationale in comments. In this section, we will look at the leadership assessment test for employment, which measures candidates' leadership potential and skills. The questions on this type of test typically involve scenarios and situational judgment and may assess traits such as decision-making, communication, conflict resolution, and delegation. Let's look at some sample leadership assessment test questions we typically see on the test to prepare you for the assessment. <laughs> Let's face it, the correct answer to this question is a brick in the foundation of your success. Build confidently as you're constructing a monument of achievement. 
you need to select the answer that best describes you to the following statement. I am more productive when I don't have to take risks as part of my job. And you're presented with seven possible choices. Choice A, strongly disagree. Choice B, disagree. Choice C, somewhat disagree. Choice D, not sure. Choice E, somewhat agree. Choice F, agree. And last but not least, choice G, strongly agree. Do you think you've encountered a tough one? Rest assured, you are not alone in this path. And I can't agree more. But regardless of your experience in problem solving, I believe in your abilities. Pause for a moment, harness your creativity, and let's face this challenge together. The answer is just waiting for your insightful touch. Oh. Are you prepared with your solution? I am curious to compare notes. Let's move forward and share our answers. To answer this question correctly, let's first understand what are we being asked. There are three important considerations here. Number one is that employers value individuals who demonstrate willingness to take calculated risk as it shows initiative, innovation, and a proactive approach to problem solving. In fact, nowadays, companies are very interested in the candidate's ability to make informed decisions, particularly when it comes to assessing risks and weighting potential outcomes. Correct response to this question should suggest that the candidate is capable of making strategic decisions that may lead to productivity gains and positive outcomes for the organization. In fact, there are four important qualities assessed in this question. Your problem-solving abilities, your levels and tolerance for innovation and creativity, your adaptability and resilience, and your strategic thinking. Let's look at each one of those in more details so we better understand how to answer this question correctly. Let's start with problem-solving abilities. Taking calculated risks often requires problem-solving skills to assess potential challenges and develop strategies to mitigate risks. Candidates who demonstrate a willingness to take calculated risks may also exhibit strong problem-solving abilities, enabling them to overcome obstacles and drive productivity in their roles. You might be surprised how indirectly this question assesses your innovation and creativity. In fact, Candidates who are open to taking calculated risks may possess a creative and innovative mindset. These candidates may be more inclined to explore new ideas, approaches, and solutions to challenges, which can lead to increased productivity and innovation within the workplace. Based on your answer, employers can also determine your levels of adaptability and resilience. In fact, candidates who are comfortable with taking calculated risks may demonstrate greater adaptability and resilience in face of uncertainty. They may be more willing to embrace change, navigate challenges, and persevere in pursuit of productivity and success. Strategic thinking, which is also assessed as part of this question, is big item on the list of employers. Taking calculated risks requires strategic thinking and an ability to anticipate potential outcomes and consequences and candidates who exhibit a willingness to take calculated risks may possess strong strategic thinking skills, enabling them to make informed decisions that align with organization goals and objectives. In summary, the simple question main focus is to measure your decision-making skills. But in addition, employer is trying to determine your levels of innovation, creativity, problem-solving, adaptability, resilience, and strategic thinking. In fact, this question measures your open-mindedness and comfort around trying new things. The correct answer depends on specifics of the job. And candidate who is more open-minded and demonstrate a willingness to take calculated risks may be perceived as more effective. Let me leave you with the sample answer if you face this question in a job interview. As a candidate, I recognize that productivity is essential in my role and I strive to maintain high levels of efficiency in my work. However, I disagree with the statement that I am more productive when I don't have to take calculated risks. While stability and predictability are valuable, I believe that taking calculated risks can lead to innovation growth and breakthroughs in performance. By disagreeing with the statement, I aim to convey my willingness to step outside of my comfort zone, embrace challenges, and explore new opportunities that may enhance productivity and contribute to the success of the organization. My approach is carefully evaluate risks, make informed decisions, and leverage opportunities to drive positive outcomes, 
ultimately maximizing productivity and achieving goals effectively. With this answer, I believe the correct answer to this question is choice B, disagree. Are you in agreement with me? If you're not, please make sure to share your answer and your suggestions in comments. A lot of times during the test, you might be presented with very uncomfortable situation to determine how you would behave. This is one of those test questions. You got promoted to the manager role that your colleague at work was also hoping for. Now things are awkward between you two. You want to keep the relationship going, but your colleague is not speaking to you outside of the required communications during the team meetings. You have five choices to select all that apply in order. Choice A. Apologize for the fact that you were promoted over your colleague. Choice B. Ask your colleague about her career aspirations. Choice C. Schedule a meeting to discuss your colleague's feelings. Choice D. Stay professional. Choice E. Prepare the 30-day action plan as a manager of the department. Take a close look, maybe pause this video, give yourself 10 to 15, maybe 20 seconds to see if you can come up with the answer. Are you ready? I am moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I think this question is about demonstrating leadership at the higher level of job responsibilities. Let's take a close look. I think you cannot control other people's reactions to your promotion. Typically, the best candidate gets selected for the promotion if there is a competition within the department. Because of this, you should not feel bad that you were selected for the job and instead of focusing on colleagues' feelings, you should focus on common goal of making department and the company move forward in the marketplace. I think your colleagues' reactions described in this question might be called stonewalling, which is one of the ways to demonstrate defensive behavior. Stonewalling means that the person shuts down when feelings are overwhelming during the conflict. Instead of looking inside and finding opportunities to get better and look forward at this experience as potential opportunity, especially when they can't do anything about the changed environment and they find the blame in another person and mentally justify their behavior. Here are some recommended steps how you can respond as a leader in your department. You should not feel bad about what happened. You were selected for promotion for a reason and there is nothing to apologize for. Number two, you should be empathetic but do not try to please your colleague. Number three, you should focus on the common goals for the department. You should build a plan to move forward, be a change agent, address all the issues that you've learned about when you were a peer with your colleague, and you should lead by example. Let's look at the key traits assessed in this question. I think the essential traits that are being assessed are empathy, leading by example, and genuinely try to help others. There are also some red flags that this question is trying to look for. For example, feeling guilty and focusing on feelings instead of work deliverables. Based on this, I think that the least recommended choices in order would be choices A and C. Choice A, apologizing for the fact that you were promoted over your friend. And choice C, schedule a meeting to discuss your colleague's feelings. I would say that the most recommended answers would be choices D, E and B. I think staying strong and maintaining professional behavior is always a good strategy, which gains you respect from peers, management, and company's customers. Instead of focusing on feelings of another person, you should focus on common goals for the department to advance your organization and do it by building an action plan. At the same time, you should genuinely try to help your colleague to advance and ask her about her career aspirations. So my recommended choices in order would be choice D, staying professional, choice E, prepare a 30-day action plan as a manager of the department, and last but not least, choice B, ask your colleague about her career aspirations. Do you have a better way to solve it? Please make sure to post your answers and rationale in comments. In this section, we will look at the sample questions for cognitive test, which represents an assessment used by employers to evaluate candidates' mental abilities, such as problem solving, critical thinking, and memory. The questions in the test can vary, but typically involve math problems, logic puzzles, spatial reasoning, and verbal comprehension. Let's look at some sample cognitive assessment test questions we typically see on the test. What's interesting about this problem is that it seems unsolvable, but if you make one correct assumption, it's so easy to solve it. You're presented with the shelf of items from the coffee shop. 
and the items are cupcakes and cookies. There are three sets of items, and two sets have price tags associated with them. And the last set does not, and you need to calculate the price tag for the last set. The first set consists of one cookie and one cupcake, and the price tag for the first set is $7. The second set consists of two cookies and one cupcake, and the price tag for the second set is $12. The last set consists of only one cupcake, and you need to calculate and select price for the cupcake out of four possible choices. Choice A, $5. Choice B, $4. Choice C, $2. And last but not least, choice D, $3. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Did you figure it out? It seems unsolvable, but the only thing you need to make is one assumption. And using this assumption, I'm going to move forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Take a close look at the first set. The first set consists of cookie and cupcake, and it costs $7. What's interesting is that the second set already includes the first set plus the cookie, which allows us to calculate the price of this extra cookie. And we can do it by subtracting 7 from 12, and the end result of it is $5, which means that the price of cookie is $5. Now we can easily calculate the price of cupcake by subtracting 5 from 7, which means that the total price of cupcake is 2. So the correct answer here is choice C, $2. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer, solution, and rationale in comments. And now I have something that maybe you were not expecting. Here's the practice question for you. You need to find the missing number, and you're presented with four scales three scales have items on the left side and the number on the right side to make them equal. And four scale only has items on the left and missing number on the right in the form of question mark. You need to calculate the question mark out of four different choices. Choice A, 60. Choice B, 65. Choice C, 70. And then last but not least, choice D, 75. Take a close look. Maybe pause this video for 10 to 15 seconds to see if you can come up with the solution. Once you're ready, please make sure to post your answer in the comments so I can give you my feedback. Thanks for participating and good luck. Here's a very interesting question to test your spatial reasoning. You're presented with partial square and you need to find the missing shape to build the full square. You have four different choices to choose from to complete the square. Choices A, B, C, and D. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. And on my end, I am moving forward to share with you the correct solution. As you might have figured out, the correct choice here is choice D. And to get to this answer, you need to look at the shape which fits perfectly to match the edges. Since this is the 5x5 five five square, Choice D is the perfect shape, because it matches perfectly to create a full square. Hopefully you've nailed this question on your own, and now know how to answer similar problems on the test. And now I have a question for you to test your skills. You're presented with the series of objects, and you need to determine next object in the sequence. Please choose one of the following four choices. Choices A, B, C, and D. Do you see the correct answer? Please make sure to post your version in comments. This would allow me to give you my feedback. Thanks for participating and good luck. Here's an amazing question where we need to find the missing number. You're presented with the tree looking like structure and it has the numbers in the circles on the top. The numbers are, if we start from the left, 50, 216, 880, and then comes the missing number you need to calculate and select the missing number out of four possible choices. Choice A, 1290. Choice B, 2565. Choice C, 2941. And last but not least, choice D, 3536. I'm gonna give you a quick hint. Take a close look to see what exactly do you see on this picture. And you see circles you see stamps, and you see numbers. And here's another consideration. 
Do you think the fact that circles have different colors matters or it doesn't? Give yourself 10 to 15 seconds to see if you can figure it out. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. The pattern here is rather simple, but it takes a little bit of time to detect it. If we start from the left, from the smallest number, and go clockwise, the next number is calculated as a previous value multiplied by the total number of lines plus total number of circles. Let's look at the example. The first number is 50 in the purple circle, and it's given, not calculated. The second number, though, is calculated previous number 50 multiplied by 4 plus 16, and the result of this is 216. Third number is calculated as 216 multiplied by 4 plus 16 and equals 880. Now you might be wondering what is 4 and where it came from and what is 16. The 4 is number of stem lines in this structure. Let's count them. 1, 2, 3, and 4. And 16 is the total number of circles. If you count them, you see 4 circles on the forefront, the ones that have number and missing number and then there are also 12 circles in the background. Now we have all of this information and we can calculate the missing number. It is calculated as 880 multiplied by 4, then we add 16, and the end result of this is 3536. So the correct answer here is choice D, 3536. Hopefully you've nailed this problem and now know how to answer similar problems on the test. But in case you need more challenges like this, please make sure to check out the description for additional resources. One of the most frequent questions we get on this channel is how to improve your pattern recognition skills. This is so important because it's an essential skill to help you pass an employment assessment test. Let me introduce you to the one of the most common English pattern called palindromes. Palindromes is a letter-based pattern which allows you to read the same word backwards and forwards. Let's look at some key examples of the words that used in the test. For example, words radar, civic, level, a race car, a henna, madam, noon, pup, eve, kayak, rotator, stats, tenet, wow, and a lot of others. Do you know any other, those other words, interesting palindromes that I didn't mention here? Please make sure to post them in comments so we can all learn. And now let's continue to get you ready for the test. Here's an absolutely phenomenal question, which is absolutely not obvious how to solve it. Instead of one question mark, you need to find two question marks. You're presented with three triangles. All triangles have a circle on the top. Blue triangle has three numbers inside. Starting from the top, the numbers are 3, 7, and 4. And number on the top is 6. Yellow triangle has numbers 2, 4, and 2, and there is a missing number on the top. Green triangle has numbers 5, 9, and 4, and missing number on the top. Take a close look to see if you can find two missing number and select out of four different choices. Choice A, 10 and 4. Choice B, 1 and 8. Choice C, 6 and 3. And choice D, 2 and 2. Do you know the answer? I gotta tell you, the answer is not really obvious, but I know how smart you are, and together we should be able to solve it. Are you ready? Hear me out. The pattern here is that to calculate the number on the top of the triangle, you need to use inside upper number, add it to the number on the right, and then you should subtract the left number. For example, for the blue triangle, which has all the numbers, the calculations will be 3 plus 7 minus 4 equals 6. For the green triangle, the calculations will be 5 plus 9 minus 4 equals 10. And for the yellow triangle, the calculations will be 2 plus 4 minus 2 equals 4. So the correct choice here is answer A, 10 and 4. Did you figure it out? Please make sure to post your answer, rationale, and thought process in comments. I get a lot of questions on how to improve your pattern recognition skills. Let me share with you three common patterns we frequently see on the test. Let's start with triangular numbers. 
triangular numbers are the numbers that can be represented as a sum of consecutive integers starting with 1. For example, the first five triangular numbers would be 1, 3, 6, 10, and 15. Next one on my list are square numbers. Square numbers are the numbers that can be represented by a product of a number multiplied by itself. For example, the first five square numbers are 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. Because 1 square is 1, 2 square is 4, 3 square is 9, 4 square is 16, and 5 square is 25. And last but not least on my list are cube numbers. Cube numbers are numbers that can be represented as a product of a number multiplied by itself twice. For example, the first five cube numbers are 1, 8, 27, 64, and 125. Because 1 cube is 1, 2 cube is 8, 3 cube is 27, 4 cube is 64, and 5 cube is 125. Do you know any other interesting numerical patterns I did mention here? Please make sure to post them in comments so we can all learn. And now let's continue to get you ready for the test. Here's the question of intermediate complexity we frequently see on the test. You're presented with four shapes, and one shape has a missing number in the middle. You need to calculate the pattern and calculate the missing number, selecting it by one of four possible choices. Choice A, 22. Choice B, 23. Choice C, 25. And then last but not least, choice D, 24. Take a close look at the shapes and see if you can calculate the pattern. Let me share with you my logic and rationale, and obviously if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to share in comments. I think the pattern here is that to calculate the middle number, you need to multiply the top two numbers and subtract one. Then add the bottom number. Let's look at the first shape to confirm the logic. 2 multiplied by 3 minus 1 equals 5. 5 plus 2, which is the bottom number, equals the middle number, which is 7. Let's apply the same pattern to the shape with the missing number. 8 multiplied by 3 minus 1 equals 24 minus 1 equals 23. 23 plus 2 equals the missing number, which means that the missing number is 25. So the correct choice here is choice C, 25. Did you see any other patterns or found the better ways to solve it? Please make sure to post your answer and rationale in comments. One of the very frequent questions we get on this channel is how to improve your pattern recognition skills. One of the key ways is to use your imagination. You can use imagination to visualize items in your mind, and this is one of the most powerful techniques. Let's take a close look at the example. Here, you're required to build English business word, and you need to use all the letters only once. If you look closely and try to visualize and build the answer in your mind, you can mentally connect the letters and get to the correct answer, which is the word management. It might be hard to do it initially, but if you do crosswords and puzzles, you can improve your skills and get better at this with practice. Do you have any other interesting techniques that you can share? Please make sure to post them in comments so we can all learn. Here's an interesting question where you need to find the missing number. You're presented with the set of numbers 4, 9, 20, 8, 5, 14, 10, 3, and then comes the missing number. You need to select or calculate the missing number out of four possible choices. Choice A, 4, choice B, 11, choice C, 13, and choice D, 34. Take a close look at this 3 by 3 matrix to see if you can come up with the solution. I hope by now you have a good understanding of the problem and maybe pause this video trying to solve it because on my end I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. And the pattern here is that the manipulation with the left and the middle number calculate right columns number. Basically in each row the third number is the sum of half of the first number and two times the second number. Let's look at the specific calculations. The first row has numbers 4, 9, and 20. 4 divided by 2 plus 9 multiplied by 2 equals 2 plus 18 and equals 20, which is exactly the number in the third column. 
Second row contains numbers 8, 5, and 14. 8 divided by 2 plus 5 multiplied by 2 equals 4 plus 10 and equals 14. And now we are ready to calculate the missing number. 10 divided by 2 plus 3 multiplied by 2 equals 5 plus 6 and equals 11. So the correct choice here is choice B, 11. Do you have a better answer? Please make sure to share your thoughts and rationale in comments. Here is the problem for you to test your business math skills as well as attention to details. You need to calculate the value by multiplying number of coins in the cent clock by the number of dollar signs. You need to select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 190. Choice B, 200. Choice C, 210. And last but not least, choice D, 230. Once you complete the calculations, please make sure to post your answer and calculations in comments so I can give you my feedback. Thanks for participating and good luck. Here is a rather unexpected question you might frequently see on the test. You need to determine during which period revenue declined and you're presented with the profit and loss chart that covers periods from 2018 to 2024. On the chart, you see three lines representing revenue expenses and taxes and you need to select the final answer out of four different choices choice a the period between 2018 and 2020 choice b the period between 2019 and 2020 choice c the period between 2020 and 2021 and choice d the period between 2023 and 2024 give yourself a little bit of time maybe pause this video to see if you can come up with the solution I'm pretty sure that by now you found it, but I'm going to move forward and reveal you my version of the solution anyway. And if you know the better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. The way I see it is that the revenue goes down between the period of 2020 and 2021, which is represented by the blue line. In 2020, the revenue was about 9.5 units, and then in 2021, it went down to approximately 8.5 units. All other highlighted periods in the question indicate revenue increases. Did you see it differently? Please make sure to post your answer in comments. In this section, we will look at the work simulation test, which is used to evaluate candidates' ability to perform tasks and skills required for the job. The questions on this type of test typically involve simulated scenarios and tasks that are similar to what the candidate would encounter on the job such as data analysis, customer service, and problem solving. Let's look at some sample work simulation assessment test questions to get you ready. Here's a very interesting question to determine how well you can work with others. You need to determine what is the best way to schedule a meeting with the client who is based in a different time zone and has limited availability. You need to select out of four possible choices. Choice A schedule the meeting without considering the client's time zone. Choice B, email the client with several date and time options without specifying the time zone. Choice C, check the client's time zone and suggest several date and time options that work for both the client and your manager. And last but not least, choice D, schedule the meeting during your manager's preferred time slot without considering the client's availability or time zone. Take a close look to see if you can select the right answer. And I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I believe the correct answer here is choice C. Option C is the best choice because it takes into consideration the client's availability and time zone. There are two stakeholders in this action, your manager and your client. And you need to check the time zone and suggest several date and time options that work for both the client and your manager. This will ensure that the meeting is scheduled at a convenient time for both parties and this minimizes the risk of confusion and miscommunication. Let's also look at other options to determine why they might be incorrect. Let's look at option A. It is wrong because it ignores the client's time zone, which will lead to scheduling conflicts. Option B is also incorrect because it does not specify the time zone which can cause confusion and miscommunication. And last but not least, option D is incorrect as well because it disregards the client's availability and time zone which can lead to scheduling conflicts and damage the company's reputation. 
When you solved this challenge on your own, did you come up with a different answer? If this is the case, please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. Very frequently on the test, companies look at your customer service skills. This is one of these types of questions. You work as a CSR and need to help troubleshoot internet connectivity. What is the best approach to troubleshoot slow internet speeds for a customer? You're presented with four choices and you need to select one. Choice A, ask the customer to restart their modem and transfer to technical support if issue persists. Choice B, ask the customer to restart their computer and transfer to technical support if issue persists. Choice C, ask the customer to check their internet connection and transfer to technical support if the issue persists. And last but not least, choice D, walk the customer through the thorough troubleshooting process, including resetting the modem and computer, checking cables and connections, and testing the internet speeds. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. If you need to pause this video, feel free to do this to reread the answers and select the correct one. On my end, I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it or have a different important considerations, please make sure to bring them up in comments. I believe the correct answer here is choice D. To remind you, in choice D, you would need to walk the customer through a thorough troubleshooting process, including resetting the modem and computer, checking cables and connections, and testing the internet speeds. Only this approach shows your commitment to providing excellent customer service and may even resolve the issue without need for technical support transfer. One important thing to note, the original question is kind of convoluted and it uses the acronyms. Just to clarify for you, CSR stands for Customer Service Representative. And now let's look at the incorrect choices, choices A, B and C to see why they are incorrect. I think those options are incorrect because they only involve asking the customer to perform a single action and then transferring them to technical support. This approach may not resolve the issue and it may result in a customer having to wait longer for the resolution. Did you come up with a different answer? If you did, please make sure to post your answer, considerations and thought process in comments. Here's a very interesting question on how to provide recommendation to your manager for the new product line. Your manager wants you to provide a recommendation on whether to continue investing in the new product line based on your analysis of the sales data. What is the best approach to analyze the sales data and provide the recommendation? You're presented with four different choices. Let's look at each one of them. Choice A, conduct a simple analysis of the sales data and provide recommendation based on initial findings. Choice B, conduct a comprehensive analysis of the sales data, including market trends and competitor data. Provide a recommendation based on your findings. Choice C, provide a recommendation based on personal opinion and expertise without conducting any analysis of the sales data. And last but not least, choice D, provide a recommendation based on the sales data from a similar product line without analyzing the sales data for the new product line. Take a close look to see if you can select the correct answer. Are you ready? Ready or not, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I think the correct answer here is choice B. In choice B, you need to conduct a comprehensive analysis of the sales data, including market trends and competitor data. Provide a recommendation based on your findings. I think this choice is correct because it allows you to provide a thorough understanding of the sales data, ensuring more accurate and informed recommendation. Conducting a comprehensive analysis of the sales data is essential in making an informed decision for your manager. Let's also look at the incorrect choices to determine why they are incorrect. Option A is too simplistic and can get the result in an incomplete assessment of the sales data. Option C is unreliable and can be seen as unprofessional since it's based on personal opinion and experience without any supporting data. And last but not least, choice D is not recommended since it involves using sales data from a similar product line, which may not be relevant to the new product line. Was your answer different? If it was, please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. In this section, we will look at numerical reasoning test questions frequently used in a test. Numerical reasoning assessment test is a standardized evaluation designed to assess individuals' ability to understand and work with numerical data, make calculations, interpret charts and graphs, and draw conclusions from quantitative information. The typical content of numerical reasoning test can vary. 
but often include topics such as basic arithmetic, percentage and ratios, data interpretation, financial analysis, mathematical problem solving, number sequences, and a lot of others. Let's look at some sample numerical reasoning assessment test questions we typically see on the test. What's interesting about this problem is that it seems unsolvable, but if you make one correct assumption, it's so easy to solve it. You're presented with the shelf of items from the coffee shop, and the items are cupcakes and cookies. There are three sets of items, and two sets have price tags associated with them, and the last set does not, and you need to calculate the price tag for the last set. The first set consists of one cookie and one cupcake, and the price tag for the first set is $7. The second set consists of two cookies and one cupcake, and the price tag for the second set is $12. The last set consists of only one cupcake, and you need to calculate and select price for the cupcake out of four possible choices. Choice A, $5. Choice B, $4. Choice C, $2. And last but not least, choice D, $3. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Did you figure it out? It seems unsolvable, but the only thing you need to make is one assumption. And using this assumption, I'm going to move forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Take a close look at the first set. The first set consists of cookie and cupcake, and it costs $7. What's interesting is that the second set already includes the first set plus the cookie, which allows us to calculate the price of this extra cookie. And we can do it by subtracting 7 from 12, and the end result of it is $5, which means that the price of cookie is $5. Now we can easily calculate the price of cupcake by subtracting 5 from 7, which means that the total price of cupcake is 2. So the correct answer here is choice C, $2. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer, solution, and rationale in comments. Here's a very interesting problem which shows how well you can do mental calculations. It will take another 5 minutes for the clock to strike 4 o'clock. How much time is left until the clock shows a quarter to 4? You're presented with two clocks. One shows 5 minutes before 4 o'clock. Second one shows quarter to 4. And you need to select the answer out of four possible choices. Choice A. 11 hours and 50 minutes. Choice B, 12 hours and 10 minutes. Choice C, 11 hours and 10 minutes. And last but not least, choice D, 10 minutes. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And if for whatever reason you think the answer should be different, please make sure to post your answer, solution and rationale in comments. Let's first determine how much time is actually on the clock. Based on the description, it will take another 5 minutes for the clock to strike 4 o'clock, which means that the clock now shows 3.55. Our next described point on the clock will be quarter to 4, which could be represented as 15.45, and clock will reach this point after around 12 hours to show 3.45 again. In the military time, which is frequently used in US, it's going to be 15.45, and it's going to be a little bit less than 15.55. Let's determine how much less than 12 hours it's going to be. Since the clock already passed 10 minutes from 3.45 to 3.55, it will take 10 minutes less than full 12 hours. This is why we can subtract 10 minutes from 12 hours to get to the answer of 11 hours and 50 minutes. So the correct answer here is choice A, 11 hours and 50 minutes. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer and rationale in comments. Here's an amazing problem where you need to exercise your brain and cognitive skills by calculating not just one number, but two numbers. You're presented with the scale, and you see that the value of diamond as well as the sum values are missing. And you need to ensure that scale remains balanced by calculating the value of the diamond as well as the sum. And once you've done with your calculations, you need to select out of four possible choices. Choice A, values 18 and 96. Choice B, values 12 and 88. Choice C, values 20 and 92. And last but not least, choice D, values 19 and 94.
take a close look, maybe pause this video to see if you can complete the calculations. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the calculations. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To solve this challenge, let's look at the picture closely to better understand what we're dealing with. We're presented with the multi-tier scale. And the scale has four tiers. Tier 1, Tier 2, Tier 3, and Tier 4. Scale remains in balance because values on the left side and on the right side are equal. And the values are represented by the total of numbers inside of each shape. For example, circle has number 12, hexagon has number 6, triangle has number 3, and square has number 4. Let's look closely at tier 3 to better understand how this tier remains in balance. As I already mentioned, each tier remains in balance because the numbers are equal on both sides. So on the left of the tier 3, we have two hexagons with total value of 12. On the right of the tier 3, we have hexagon, which equals number 6, plus 2 triangles, 3 plus 3. So on both sides, the total value is 12. This is why tier 3 remains in balance. Now let's look closely at the tier 2. On the left of the tier 2, we have two circles. Each circle has a value of 12. Two circles would be equal 24. On the left of the tier 2, we have two circles with total value of 24 and the entire tier 3, which also equals 24. This is what keeps tier 2 in balance. Now, knowing this logic, we can calculate the missing value on tier 4. Because tier 4 needs to remain in balance, the value of 12 plus 6 should be equal to the missing value, which means that the missing value is 18. And the total sum will be calculated as the sum of all the numbers. The sum of tier 2 and tier 3 would be 24 plus 24 plus 48 on the right side of tier 1, which would equal 96. So the correct answer here is choice A, 18 and 96. Did you get to the different answer? Please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. Here's a very interesting question where answer is absolutely not obvious. You're presented with interestingly looking shapes. On top of the shape is triangle. On the bottom left and on the bottom right, there are squares. There are numbers inside the triangle. And there are also numbers inside the squares. Let's take a close look. The first object has number 5 inside the triangle and number 3 in the left square and number 17 in the right square. Second object has number 4 inside the triangle and numbers 5 and 22 inside the squares. The third object has number 3 inside the square and numbers 8 and 26 inside the squares. The fourth object has number 2 inside of the triangle, number 7 in the left square, and then comes the missing number inside the right square. And did I mention that all objects are of a different colors? If we go from left to right, we start with red on the left, next goes light blue, yellow, and then darker blue. And obviously you are the one who needs to make sense out of it and calculate the missing number. Once calculated, select the final answer out of four possible choices. Choice A, 14. Choice B, 25. Choice C, 16. And last but not least, choice D, 20. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. Are you ready? Because on my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. If you are a frequent visitor to this channel, or even better, if you are a subscriber, you probably know that the key to solving these types of challenges is to understand the pattern. And the pattern here is that the number in the right square is calculated. And it's calculated by multiplying the number inside of the triangle onto the left square number. And on top of this multiplication, you also add 2 to the end result of the calculation. Let's look at the example. If we multiply 5 by 3 in the first object, the end result of this calculation would be 15. Then we add 2 to 15, and that's how we get to the number in the right square, which is 17. Let's look at the second example. 4 multiplied by 5 equals 20, plus 2 equals 22. Now let's move to the third object. 3 multiplied by 8 is 24, plus 2 equals 26. And now comes the missing number. To calculate it, we need to multiply 2 by 7, which would be equal to 14 and then add 2, and the end result of this would be 16. So the correct answer here is choice C, 16. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. 
Here's a very interesting question where you need to calculate the missing number. You are presented with four circles. Each circle is of a different color. The first circle has number one inside of it. Second circle has number two. Third circle has number five inside. And last circle has the missing number represented by the question mark. You need to calculate and select final answer out of four possible choices. Choice A, 24. Choice B, 26. Choice C, 16. And last but not least, choice D, 20. Take a close look to see if you can calculate the final answer. Are you ready? I hope you found the answer because it's so easy to calculate. Let's move forward so I can share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I keep repeating myself when I say that finding pattern is the key to solve this challenge. And the pattern here is that the next number is calculated as a square value of the previous number plus 1. Let's look at the example. The first number is given, which is 1. Second number is calculated as 1 square plus 1 and equals 2. The third number is calculated as 2 square plus 1 and equals 5 which means that the missing number is calculated as 5 square, which would be equal to 25, plus 1, which would be equal to 26. So the correct answer here is choice B, 26. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer and rationale in comments. Here is the challenging problem by solving which you will boost your cognitive abilities. You're presented with 5 hints and using these hints, you need to unlock the code and open the lock. The hints are, in the digits 248, only one digit is correct and well placed. In the digits 845, two digits are correct but not correctly placed. In the digits 461, only one digit is correct and it is correctly placed. In the digits 592, only one digit is correct and it is well placed. And last but not least, hint that in the digits 904, None of the digits are correct. To open the lock, you need to process all the hints and select one out of four possible choices. Choice A, 518. Choice B, 485. Choice C, 418. And last but not least, choice D, 568. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. I am pretty sure you're done solving it by now, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer and solution. And if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might have guessed, you solve this problem through elimination. And I'm going to start with the hint number 5, because it's the most helpful of all. Once we've learned that in combination 904 none of the digits are correct, we can eliminate two possible answers. We can eliminate both choices B and C, because both of them have digit 4, which is an incorrect digit. Let's continue elimination to get to the correct answer. If we look through the remaining four hints, we learn that in hint 1, where digits are 2, 4, 8, only one digit is correctly placed, which is digit 8. In hint 2, two digits are correct, but they are not correctly placed, and they are digits 8 and 5. In hint 3, only one digit 6 is correct, and it is correctly placed. And last but not least, in hint 4, digit 5 is correct, and it is well placed. Based on this, the correct answer here is choice D. 5, 6, 8. Do you have any hints to show how to best solve these types of challenges? If you do, please make sure to post them in comments. Have you ever dealt with the money tree? Well, now it's your opportunity. And it's your opportunity to check your attention to details. You are presented with the money tree making enterprise. And you need to calculate the total value of money that you see in the picture. What's interesting here is that each coin is one cent and each bill equals one dollar. You need to identify all coins and all bills and count the total value. Once you complete the calculations, please select one out of four possible choices. Choice A, ten dollars and eighteen cents. Choice B, twelve dollars and nine cents. Choice C, fifteen dollars and fifteen cents. And last but not least, choice D, $18.07. Take a close look to see if you can complete the calculations. I think the correct answer here is choice A, $10.18. And here's why. I counted $10 in the picture. Let's start with the top of the money tree. 1, 2, 3, 
four. And then on the right, we see another group of the dollar bills. There are five dollars there. Let's count them together. One, two, three, four, five. And then we see the hard to notice dollar bill on the top of the flower pot. Now let's count the coins. We see nine coins to the right of the flower pot. Then we see eight coins coming out of the watering can. And then there is one coin on top of the watering can, which is easy to miss. Did you get to the same answer? Choice A, $10.18. If you didn't, please make sure to post your answer and whatever other coins or dollar bills I missed in comments. Here's a puzzling question for you, but I have full confidence that you can solve it quickly. You're presented with 4x4 four four matrix, and the numbers are starting in the upper left corner, 9, 8, 3, 4. The second row numbers are 2, 9, 2, and then comes the missing number. The third row starts with 4, 6, 2, 0. And last but not least row is 7, 6, 2, and 6. You need to calculate the missing number. And you have four different choices to select from. Choice A, 2. Choice B, 5. Choice C, 6. And last but not least, choice D, 7. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. Did you get to the right answer? I hope you did, because I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. You're probably tired of hearing this in this channel, but to solve these types of challenges, you need to detect the pattern. And the pattern here is that the last two digits are equal to the sum of the first two digits multiplied by two. Let's look at the example. The first row contains numbers 9, 8, 3, 4. And the expression here is that 9 plus 8 in parentheses multiplied by 2 equals 34. Based on this logic, the third number would be 4 plus 6 in parentheses multiplied by 2, which would be equal to 20, which represents the set of numbers 4, 6, and then 20. And then the last row would be 7 plus 6 in parentheses multiplied by 2, which would be 13 multiplied by 2, which would be equal to 26. So the missing number would be calculated as 2 plus 9 multiplied by 2 equals 22. So the correct answer here is choice A, 2. Did you get to the same answer? If you didn't, or maybe you got to a different answer, please make sure to post your version in comments. You will enjoy this question because it tests your logical thinking and analytical skills. You are presented with the dart in the exact middle of the dartboard. Dart has numbers on top of the ribbon and at the end of the ribbon. The numbers on the ribbon are 13, 18, 41, 128, and 517. Numbers at the end of the ribbon are 18, 41, 128, 517, and then comes the missing number you need to calculate and select out of four possible choices. Choices A, 1921, choice B, 2029, choice C, 2359, and last but not least, choice D, 2590. Give yourself a moment, maybe pause this video to see if you can calculate the answer. Are you ready? Let's move forward so I can share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. First, to answer this question, let's understand what we're dealing with. Since this game may not be very familiar in all the parts of the world, let's start with the definition. Darts is the competitive sport in which players throw small sharp pointed missiles, known as darts, at the round target known as dartboard. Now let's look closely at the dart we're dealing with. Our dart is unique because it has ribbons. There is a number on the ribbon and there is a calculated number at the end of the ribbon. To complete the calculations, let's assign each ribbon unique number. We're dealing with ribbons 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. And as you might have already figured out, the number at the end of the ribbon is calculated based on the sequence ID and number on top of the ribbon itself. The formula to do the calculations is that the end of the ribbon number is calculated as number on top of the ribbon multiplied by sequence ID plus 5. Let's look at the example. The first blue ribbon has the sequence number 1 so that the end of the ribbon number is calculated as 13 multiplied by 1 plus 5, which would be equals 18. 
the second ribbon number is calculated as 18 multiplied by 2 plus 5 equals 41. The third ribbon number is calculated as 41 multiplied by 3 plus 5 equals 128. And the fourth ribbon number is calculated as 128 multiplied by 4 plus 5 equals 517. Now we know how to calculate the missing number. The missing number is calculated as 517 multiplied by 5 plus 5, which would be equal to 2590. So the correct answer here is choice D, 2590. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. In this section, we will look at the personality assessment test questions. A personality assessment test is a type of psychological evaluation used during the hiring process to assess candidates' personality traits, behavioral tendencies, and work-related preferences. This test aims to provide insights on how a candidate might behave, interact with others, and fit into the company's culture. The typical purpose of personality assessment is to gauge a candidate's suitability for a particular job or work environment based on their personality traits. Personality assessment test helps employers to identify individuals who possess the desired characteristics and align with the organizational values. Let's look at some sample personality assessment test questions we typically see on the test. Here's a very interesting question which you cannot just answer because you need a strategy and approach on how to answer. You need to select from two statements, one that best describes you and one that describes you the least. And your choices for selections are Choice A, I should have all the information before making a decision. Choice B, I easily communicate with people. Choice C, I like to take responsibility for my team. And last but not least, choice D, I prefer long-term projects over short-term ones. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. And more importantly, you need to decide on what type of considerations you would choose to answer this particular question. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I think is that the most important consideration here to answer this question is job relevance. You need to consider the requirements and responsibilities of the role that you're applying for. For example, one differentiation might be individual contributor role versus a leadership role. By doing this differentiation, the describe me the most will identify statements that will demonstrate the good fit for the particular job position. And for describe me the least, will provide reasons why based on the position, this may not be applicable. And obviously, you would need to support the answer with the examples from your past career. Let's look at how you might consider answering this question if you're applying for individual contributor jobs. The individual contributor jobs is where you as individual responsible for the outcomes. Samples of these jobs might be data analyst, research scientist, software engineer, quality assurance specialist, financial analyst, technical writer, graphics designer, and a lot of others. Here, the preferential answers would be choices A and D. Let's look at choice A first. Choice A, I should have all the information before making the decision. The statement for individual contributor job suggests the preference for thoughtfulness and careful decision making. In an individual contributor role, it's important to be detailed-oriented and make informed decisions based on available information. This trait can be valuable in roles that require precise execution and attention to details. Choice D, I prefer long-term projects over short-term ones, is also preferred for individual contributor roles. This statement indicates a preference for working on the projects that have longer duration. In an individual contributor role, this trait may be beneficial for tasks or projects that require patience, persistence, and focus on long-term goals. It suggests an ability to sustain effort and commitment over the extended periods of times. Now, if you're applying for leadership position, you might consider choosing choices B and C as the ones that would represent you as a candidate for this position. Leadership positions are positions like team lead, project manager, director, vice president, department manager, sales manager, marketing manager, operations managers, human resources manager, and a lot of others. Let's look at both choices B and C individually to see why selecting them might be beneficial when applying for leadership positions. Choice B, I easily communicate with people. 
The statement highlights strong interpersonal communication skills, which are essential for a leadership position. Effective communication is a crucial for building relationships, conveying information, and motivating and influencing others. Strong communication skills can contribute for successful leadership and collaboration within the team. Choice C, I like to take responsibility for my team, highlights the desire to take ownership and accountability for the success in the team. In a leadership position, the ability to assume responsibility, provide guidance, and support team members is crucial. It indicates a willingness to lead by example, make decisions, and make necessary actions to drive team performance and achieve goals. One important point to understand is that I'm not asking you to provide an incorrect answers. I'm asking you to decide how your past experiences can be helpful to the role you're applying for. There is a valid you selected to apply for this particular position, and the reason is because you believe your qualifications are aligned with position description. So what you need to do here, answering this question, you need to align the answers with the job requirements. My three recommendations for you on how to answer these types of questions is provide authenticity, provide self-reflection, and provide supporting examples. Let's look at each one individually to help you decide how to answer this particular question. Let's look at number one, authenticity. You need to provide honest and genuine responses that accurately reflect your personality traits and tendencies. It is essential to be true to yourself and true to your employer rather than trying to present what you think the employer might be looking for. Number two is self-reflection. Take a moment to reflect on your own characteristics and behaviors. Consider your strengths, weaknesses, preferences, and areas where you excel or struggle. And number three, think of the supporting examples. Justify your choices by providing specific examples or instances from your past experience. This helps add credibility to your responses and allows the employer to understand your reasons and thought process. Next, I am going to share with you my answer if you're applying for the leadership position. And I'm also going to ask you to provide your answer for the individual contributor role. For example, if you're applying for leadership position, I recommend that you choose choice C and choice A. Choice C, I like to take responsibility for my team, would represent the answer that best describes you. Your actual justification for this choice may sound like this. As a leader, I thrive on guiding and supporting my team toward success. I believe that fostering a collaborative and empowering work environment where individuals can grow and excel. Taking responsibility for my team means ensuring their development, providing guidance when needed, and creating a cohesive and motivated group that can achieve outstanding results. The statement that describes you the least might be choice A, and choice A states, I should have all the information needed before making the decision. The justification for the answer might be, while I value the thoughtfulness and informed decision making, as a leader, I understand that time-sensitive situations may require making decisions with a limited information. I am comfortable relying on my experience, intuition, and the input of trusted team members to make timely decisions while considering the available information. I'm also open to adjusting decisions as more information becomes available to ensure the best possible outcomes. Now, what do you think the answer should be for the individual contributor role? Please make sure to post your answer, recommendation, and justification in comments of this video so we can all learn. I love this question because it tests candidates' ability to prioritize as well as candidates' leadership skills. You're presented with the question where you need to select two statements one statement that best describes you and another that describes you the least. The four possible answers to this question would be A. I can organize my work schedule by myself. Choice B. I work even better when everything goes wrong. Choice C. I think small details are important. And last but not least, choice D. I like to be best player on my team. Take a close look to see if you can come up with two answers. On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer, and obviously if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Let's first look at the important considerations on how you can select the right answer. There are three important considerations here, and they all fall into one category, job relevance. You need to consider the requirements and responsibilities of the role you're applying for. Number two, you need to think about how each statement relates to the demands of the position. 
And last but not least, number three, you need to choose the statement that demonstrates a good fit for the job and showcases qualities that would be beneficial for the specific context. Let's take a look at how you would select the right answer in the specific categories. Let's start by looking at the choice A. I can organize my work schedule by myself. If you choose this answer, it would show that you are a self-structured person that could work independently. Choice B, I work even better when everything goes wrong, shows your stress tolerance, your ability to work in stressful and unpredictable situations. Choice C, I think small details are important, would show your level of attention to details that could be important for jobs such as accounting, programming, controller, and other jobs that require attention to details. And last but not least, choice D, I like to be the best player on my team, shows how competitive you are. This is a good choice for the sales position, but could be a problematic choice for the manager roles. Let's look at the examples of the choices that best describe me. One of the choices that you might select would be choice A. I can organize my work schedule by myself. I am a very disciplined person. I can independently prioritize different tasks and I can take responsibility of the results of my job. I prefer to organize my work schedule by myself without overattention from managers. I can be much more productive by working in this way. This is why I selected the choice A, I can organize my work schedule by myself. Now let's look at the choice that at least describes you and considerations you might consider providing. For that statement, I selected choice D. I like to be the best player on my team. Of course, I want to show off my skills and I want results be fairly evaluated. But I understand the importance of teamwork for good results. And in this way, I can do a back office job when it's necessary. I will put overall results of my team in the first place, even if it's temporary slows down my own results and my progress. Do you have any other suggestions on how you can answer this type of questions? Please make sure to post them in comments so we can all learn. In this section, we will look at the sample questions for verbal reasoning test for employment, which typically represents an assessment used by employers to measure candidates' ability to comprehend and analyze written information. The questions typically involve reading passages, answering questions based on the information presented, as well as identifying relationships between words and understanding the vocabulary. Let's look at some sample questions that you typically see on the test to make sure you get ready. Here's the question you will definitely enjoy solving. You're presented with eight letters and you need to determine the next letter in the sequence. The letters you see are D, J, F, M, A, M, J, J, and then comes the missing letter, which you need to select out of four possible choices. Choice A, J, choice B, A, choice C, F, and choice D, M. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. I am going to give you a quick hint. Try to solve the pattern by thinking about Christmas and then New Year and then think what comes next. I hope this hint was helpful because I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might have guessed, the sequence represents the first letters of each month starting from December. This is why I started with Christmas. Then comes January. This is why I mentioned New Year then February, March, April, May, June, July, and as you might have guessed, the next month would be August, which starts with A. So the correct answer here is choice B, A. I truly hope that you came up with the correct version of the answer on your own, and if you didn't, learn how to answer similar problems on the test. <laughs> Admit it or not, but deciphering this question is like teaching a penguin to fly. A real flap, but once you soar through, it's a flight of an accomplishment. I wonder if these questions are secretly evaluating our ability to navigate unconventional situations. You're presented with the circle which contains letters inside. Three letters are missing. You need to build English business word by selecting three possible letters. For choice A, the letters are A, Y, and Y. For choice B, the letters are A, E, Y. For choice C, the letters are E, T, O. And for choice D, the letters are a, A, and Y. Feeling challenged? It's okay, you are not alone. I feel the same way. Whether you're a seasoned solver or casual questions explorer, I have faith in your problem-solving abilities. Give it the time it deserves, think outside the box, and watch the pieces fall into place. I have full confidence that you've got what it takes.
Are you ready with your solution? Still not ready? Let me give you a hint. This word represents a comprehensive plan that outlines organizations' long-term goals and objectives, along with actions and tactics required to achieve them. I am pretty sure you've got this now. The word is strategy. Strategy involves making decisions how to allocate resources, such as people, capital, and time, to gain a competitive advantage in the market. So the missing letters are A, E, and Y, and the correct choice here is B. With this question, it's pretty clear that explaining data analytics to your grandma is like decoding a complex algorithm with a punchline. The interpretation might be fuzzy, but the laughter is always in the regression. You're presented with four words, and you need to determine the one that is misspelled. The words are choice A, concatenation, choice B, normalization, choice C, aggregation, and last but not least, choice D, duplication. Feel that you stumbled upon a tough task? Well, it's not one of those your grandma questions. I can tell you this. It's a serious data analytics business, but you are not alone in this journey. Whether you're a problem-solving veteran or newcomer, I believe in your capabilities. Take a moment to reflect, tap into your creativity, and let's tackle this challenge together. Your answer is just waiting to be discovered. Are you ready with your answer? Let's move forward so we can sync up the solutions. To be able to best answer this question, let's understand the meaning of each word. Concatenation stands for merging or combining two or more things, such as datasets or strings, into a single entity. Normalization is adjusting and scaling data to a standard format or range for consistent analysis. Aggregation is summarizing or combining data to obtain overall insights or totals. And last but not least, duplication is creating identical copies of data or records within a dataset. I'm pretty sure you figured it by now. The misspelled word is choice C, aggregation. The correct spelling is A-G-G, -G, two G's here in this word, R-E-G-A-T-I-O-N. Let's dive into the world of letters with this amazingly tricky question that not only evaluates your English alphabet knowledge, but also tests your analytical skills and your strategies for tackling challenges effectively. You're presented with 3x3 three three matrix. The matrix has letters inside. The first row has letters A, B, and D. The second row has letters B, D, and F. And then the third row has letters D, F, and then comes the missing letter, which you need to select out of four possible choices. Choice A, H. Choice B, D. Choice C, F. And last but not least, choice D, K. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. I mentioned that this question is a little tricky, so let me give you a hint. Take a close look and consider why would some boxes, some squares in the matrix would be in gray and some would be in white. Was it helpful? I hope it was. I've unlocked my answer and I'm excited to unveil some hints for you to share the answer. Let's explore the solution together. And obviously, if you've came up with the different and more creative alternative solution or tips how to solve these types of challenges effectively, make sure to post them in comments. To answer this question correctly, let's look at our matrix from a little different dimension. Each letter here corresponds to a specific place in the alphabet, which can be represented by the number. For example, letter A equals 1, letter B 2, C 3, and etc. If we follow this logic, we can replace all letters in all three rows with the numbers. So for the first row, the numbers will be 1, 2, and 4. For the second row, the numbers would be 2, 4, and 6. And for the third row, the numbers will be 4 and 6, and that would be the missing number. The next step is to determine what's happening with the numbers and how to calculate the missing number. Remember I gave you a hint? Hope you figured it out because numbers in the white squares here are the result of addition of numbers in the gray squares. Let's look at the example. For example, 2 plus 2 equals 4. 4 plus 2 equals 6. This is how the numbers in the white squares of the second row are calculated. 2 plus 4 equals 6. This is the result of the calculation in the third row, which would mean that the missing number 
on the intersection of 4 and 4 will be calculated as addition of 4 plus 4, which would be equal to 8. So the correct answer here is choice A, H, because H is the letter that corresponds to the number 8. Here is an amazing question to test your verbal reasoning and analytical skills. You need to arrange the words into a coherent sentence and determine the last word in this sentence. The words are A. Coverage B. Protects C. Against D. Financial E. Losses F. Business G. Risks Take a close look, see if you can build this sentence and determine the last word in this sentence. Did you figure it out? I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To get to the correct answer, let's look at each word in this sentence to determine the meaning of the word and how to use it correct way. We start with the words coverage, business and risks. These are not the objects of the sentence. We also look at the against and financial. These are prepositions and adjectives. The word protects is the verb and it provides valuable information in the sentence. The word losses is the object of the sentence and it provides information about what business insurance protects against. Based on this information, let's build the sentence. Business insurance protects against financial losses. Based on this, we can determine that the last word in the sentence is losses. And this is the object of the sentence, and it also provides a specific type of protection. So I believe the correct answer here is choice E, losses. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. Here's an amazing question which tests your logical reasoning and verbal reasoning skills. You're presented with three verbal statements, and you need to determine if the final statement is true. The first statement is, most small businesses are family-owned. The second statement is, most family-owned businesses are profitable. And the last statement, most small businesses are profitable. Is this statement true? You need to select out of three possible choices. Choice A, yes. Choice B, no. And last but not least, choice C is uncertain. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. Are you ready? Because on my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I believe the correct answer here is A, yes. Which means that most small businesses are profitable. And this is the accurate statement. Which means that the statement, most small businesses are profitable, is true. Let me explain you why. If most small businesses are family-owned, and most family-owned businesses are profitable, then it stands to reason that most small businesses are also profitable. What's interesting to note about this question is that answer C, uncertain, might also be accurate, and some test systems might be configured to accept it as the accurate answer. And the main reason is that the relationship between the statements are unclear or if there's insufficient information to make logical conclusions, you can answer uncertain. Was your answer different? Please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. I love this question because the answer represents such a powerful business concept. You're presented with 10 letters and you need to build English business word by using each letter only once. The letters are N, I, N, A, V, O, N, I, T, O. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. I am going to give you a quick hint. The word refers to the process of introducing new ideas, products, services, or processes that add value to society, the economy, or organizations. Did you figure it out? I hope the hint was helpful because I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And if you have a better way to solve it, as usual, please make sure to post in comments. My answer is innovation, and the word is spelled as I-N-N-O-V-A-T-I-O-N.
What's interesting is that innovation involves combining creativity, technology, and practicality to develop new solutions that meet people's needs and address emerging challenges. Innovation is also crucial for the growth and development of the businesses, economies, and societies, and it drives competitiveness, productivity, and progress. Let's look at the examples of the most recent consumer innovations. Number one is streaming services. The popularity of streaming services such as Netflix, Hulu and Disney Plus disrupted the traditional TV industry by offering on-demand access to the vast library of movies and TV shows. The fact that I can broadcast my videos and share them with you directly is also part of streaming services innovation. The next one on my list is electric cars. The development of electric cars by companies such as Tesla, Nissan and Chevrolet has provided consumers with a more sustainable and energy-efficient alternative to traditional gasoline-powered vehicles. Another example of recent innovation is wearable technology. The emergence of wearable technologies such as smartwatches, fitness trackers and virtual reality headsets had powered people to track their health and fitness, stay connected and experience immersive digital content. We also recently enjoyed innovation of online marketplaces. Companies such as Amazon, eBay and Etsy revolutionized the way people shop by providing them with vast selection of products, competitive prices and fast delivery options. And last but not least on my list is the smart home technology. The rise of smart home technology allowed people to control and automate various aspects of their homes from lightning and temperature to security and entertainment using voice commands and mobile apps. Do you know any other examples of recent innovations? Please make sure to share them in comments so we can all learn. There is no better question to boost your IQ and brain power. You're presented with three expressions and you need to find the missing item in the third expression. The first expression is B plus D equals F. The second expression is Z minus W equals C. And the third expression is D multiplied by E equals missing item. And you need to find and select the missing item out of four possible choices. Choice A, T. Choice B, S. Choice C, U. And last but not least, choice D, I. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the missing item. I'm going to give you a quick hint here. To solve this challenge, you need to know English alphabet. But it's one of the simplest alphabets available with only 26 letters. Are you ready? Let's move forward, so I'll share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To solve this challenge, you really need to have a good understanding of English alphabet. And not just the alphabet, but also analytically understand that you can assign a number for each letter of the alphabet. I already mentioned that there are 26 letters in English alphabet and this is probably one of the first things you study when you study English. So the letters are would be A, B, C, D and so on and you can go forward and for each letter you can assign the number. For example, letter A will get associated with number 1, letter B will be associated with number 2, C with 3, D with 4. E was 5 and you can continue up to the letter Z which would be associated with number 26. With this cross-reference let's see if we can get a better conversion between letters and numbers. For example expression B plus D equals F in reality after conversion would be 2 plus 4 equals 6 which makes mathematical sense. Let's look at the second one Z minus W equals C would in reality be equal 26 which is the number associated with letter Z minus 23 which is the number associated with letter W which would be equal to 3. So the last expression D multiplied by E in reality would be equal 4 multiplied by 5 and would be equal to 20 which is associated with the letter T. So the correct answer here is choice A T. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer and rationale in comments. There is an amazing question to test your English business vocabulary. You need to build English business word using all the letters presented on the screen. And you only need to use each letter once. The letters are G-O-I-S-L-T-I-C-S. -S. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Because I want you to succeed so much, I'm going to give you a quick hint. 
The word represents the process of planning, implementing and controlling the movements of storage of goods or materials from the point of origin to the point of consumption. Did you figure it out? I'm going to move forward and share with you my version of the answer. But if you have a better way or alternative way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. The answer is logistics. The word is spelled as L-O-G-I-S-T-I-C-S. To get better at solving these types of challenges, try to visualize the word and try different combinations. For example, if you look at original nine letters, you will see that if we start from the middle, you can start building the word L-O-G and then you build the remainder of the word to get to the correct answer. Do you have any other tips, tricks, or techniques that can help you solve these types of challenges? Please make sure to post them in comments. In this section, we will look at Microsoft Excel questions frequently used in a test. Microsoft Excel test is a standardized assessment designed to measure an individual's proficiency in using this powerful spreadsheet software application. This test assesses a candidate's knowledge and skills in various Excel functions, formulas, data manipulation, formatting, and data analysis. It is commonly used by employers during the hiring process to determine a candidate's level of Excel proficiency. This assessment typically includes a variety of Excel tasks and exercises that range from basic to more advanced functionalities within Microsoft Excel. These tasks might involve creating and formatting spreadsheets, performing calculations using formulas and functions, managing data sets, creating charts and graphs, and demonstrating an understanding of data analysis techniques. Let's look at some sample Microsoft Excel test questions we typically see on the test. Here is an amazing question which is frequently used for analyst Excel assessment test. Steve is analyzing the data set of sales transactions, which has gaps in data after system crash. Which formula should he use to determine the number of all revenue generating transactions? And you're presented with the data set as well as four different choices. Choice A, count A2 through A11. Choice B, count A and then the ranges E2 through E11. Choice C, count blank and then in parentheses data set D2 through D11. And last but not least, count if C2 through C11 and then star in quotes. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. What interesting about this question is that all answers will generate the output, so there are no errors that will be generated. But to answer this question, you need to solve the business problem. And as usual, I'm going to move forward to share with you my version of the solution. And if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I believe the correct answer here is choice B, count A for the range E2 through E11. Once we enter this formula, you can see that there are eight records that are not blank. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And ultimately, this choice, choice B, will count the number of non-blank cells in the revenue column. Since the revenue column contains the total revenue generated by each transaction, the result of this formula will be equal to the number of transactions for which revenue was generated. And this particular formula will help us answer the question, how many transactions actually generated the revenue? Now let's look at other choices to better understand why they are incorrect. Choice A, where formula is used is count and the ranges A2 through E11. There are nine values counted as a result of this formula. And in fact, this formula will count the number of non-blank cells in the ID column. Since each transaction has a unique ID, the result of this formula will help us answer the question, how many valid transactions were there in total? Now let's look at choice C, count blank for the range D2 through D11. This formula returns value of 1. And this is absolutely correct because this formula counts the number of blank cells in the quantity column. And it helps us answer the question, how many transactions had no units sold? And last but not least is choice D, count if for the range C2 through C11 with the star in quotes. This formula returns the value of 9. And in fact, this is absolutely correct 
because this formula counts the number of cells in the product column that contain certain text. Since the wildcard was used, which star represents wildcard, all transactions with non-blank product values will be counted. This is why this formula is helpful to answer business question, how many transactions have non-blank product values? Do you have any other solutions or considerations? Please make sure to share them in comments so we can all learn. Here's an interesting question to test your knowledge of Excel formulas and functions. June is a small business owner and she recorded her sales figures in an Excel spreadsheet. She needs to calculate total sales for 2022. Which of the following formulas will calculate the total sales correctly? You're presented with the snapshot of data from Microsoft Excel, and you need to select one out of four possible choices. Choice A equals sum B3 through B6. Choice B equals add and then in parentheses B3 through B6. Choice C equals total, and then in parentheses, B3 through B6. And last but not least, choice D equals product, and then in parentheses, equals B3 minus B6. Do you know the answer? I have full confidence that you can quickly solve this challenge. And I'm going to move forward to share with you my answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to share in comments. To solve this challenge, you need to understand the data and know Microsoft Excel formulas and functions. As you might have figured out, the correct answer here is choice A equals sum and then in parentheses range B3 through B6. Sum function in Excel adds up the range of numbers. And to calculate the total sales for 2022, we need to add up all the sales figures for all quarters in 2022. As you can see, column B represents the sales data for 2022 and rows 3 through 6 represent quarterly sales. Now we know that the correct answer is choice A equals sum and then in parentheses cell B3 through B6. Let's look at why other options are incorrect. Option B, add values B3 through B6 is not a valid Excel formula. Option C, total B3 through B6 is also not a valid Excel formula. And choice product B3 minus B6 will multiply the values in the range B3 through B6 together and it will not give you the total sales for 2022. In fact, if you looked at the choice D, the values supplied is not even the range. It's the difference between the values of B3 and B6 because we're supplying only one argument which is the result of mathematical operation B3 minus B6. And in fact, the output of this function product B3 minus B6 will be negative because it's a result of a subtraction of 337 minus 439 and then result will be negative 101.91. Do you have any other thoughts or considerations about this question? Please make sure to share them in comments. Here's an amazing question to test your knowledge of frequently used Microsoft Excel functions. Lakshmi needs to determine the smallest quarterly sales amount for 2023. Which of the following formulas can she use in Microsoft Excel to accomplish this? You're presented with the snippet of data and you have four different choices to choose from. Formula min and then you have values in parentheses table B3 through table E6. Choice B, min FS and then value in parentheses B3 through E6. Choice C, min A, B3 through E6 in parentheses, and last but not least, choice D, min B3 through E6. Take a close look, maybe pause this video to see if you can come up with the solution. On my end, I'm going to jump to Microsoft Excel to share with you my version, and obviously if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. I believe the correct answer here is choice D using min function and then in parentheses supplying argument B3 through E6. To understand the answer, let's look at the data. We have source data for quarterly sales located in the range B3 through E6. We have four salespeople on the left and then we have quarterly sales represented in the row 2. Min function returns the minimum value in the range of sales and it can be used to determine the smallest quarterly amount for 2023. Since the formula is correct and the range of cells selected is correct, 
mean function will calculate the smallest amount. And smallest amount is equals 253.11. To reinforce the knowledge, let's also look at the incorrect answers to better understand why they are incorrect. Choice A is incorrect because it does not return the valid results. Let's try it. You see that the syntax is not correct. Choice B, mean IFS function, sends the incorrect number of arguments into the function and thus generates an error. You've entered too few arguments for this function. Choice C, on the other hand, mean A function, has too many arguments and doesn't return any results. So the correct choice here is choice D when we use the min function to find the smallest sales. Do you have any other suggestions? Please make sure to post them in comments. Here is an interesting question to test how well you know average formula as well as its variations. Isabella is trying to calculate the average new wave sales across all the regions. Which formula should she select? You are presented with the data set as well as four different choices. Choice A average formula and parameters to supply C2 through C10. Choice B, average A formula and parameters supplied are C2 through C10. Choice C, average if formula and the values are C2 through C10 and the second parameters is greater than zero. And last but not least is average if S and then as the arguments you see the range C2 through C10 Second argument is range A2 through A10. Third argument is not equal to D. Fourth argument B2 through B10. And the last argument is not equals to South. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the right answer. And in my end, I am going to jump to Excel to show you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. As you might have guessed, the correct answer is choice A. All you need to do is type the average formula and then select the data set C2 through C10 to calculate the average sales value for all the regions. What's interesting about choice B is that technically it is also a correct answer. Average A with the range C2 through C10 will also calculate the average sales, but it includes all the values in the range even if they have text or errors. In this case, since all values in the range are numbers, the two functions, choice A and choice B, will give you the same result. What's interesting is that option C, average if with the values C2 through C10 and second parameter greater than zero, calculates the average of all sales that are greater than zero and gives you the same result. But it's not a recommended option because the end result may not always be the same as average of all sales. And the last choice, option D, average if S with all the parameters that we supply, calculates the average sales for all products and regions, except for the product soda and except the values in the south region. This is more specific calculation than the average of all sales and does not represent the right answer. Did this question trigger some thoughts or considerations in your mind? Please make sure to share in comments so we can all learn. And now, here is the practice question for you. In this question, I am not going to give you the answer, but instead I am going to ask you to post your solution in comments so I can give you my feedback. June is a small business owner and she recorded her sales figures in Excel spreadsheet. She needs to calculate total sales for 2022. Which of the following formulas will calculate the sales correctly? You are presented with the data set and four different choices. Formulas are sum, add, total and product and they point to the range B3 through B6. Take a close look to see if you can answer the business question. And once ready, make sure to post your answer in comments so I can give you my feedback. Thanks for participating and good luck. Here's the very interesting question to test your knowledge of rounding in Microsoft Excel. Technology startup company sent 46 members for an off-site training. At the training facility, they were organized into seven member groups. Which Excel formula do you need to use to calculate number of teams with all members, ignoring any remainders? You are presented with four different choices. Choice A, 
divide cell A2 by B2. Choice B. You use round down formula and supply A2 divided by B2 as a first argument and as a second argument you supply 0. Choice C. You use round formula and then supply A2 divided by B2 and second argument you supply as 0. And last but not least, you use round up formula and then in parentheses you supply division of A2 by B2 and second argument as 0. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Because on my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, or have any other feedback or suggestions, please make sure to post in comments. I believe the correct answer here is choice B, round down. And the reason is because to solve this challenge, we need to use Excel formula, which rounds the number down to the nearest integer. To simulate this scenario in Microsoft Excel, let's use round down formula, and you can see that it rounds a number down towards zero. And then let's supply arguments A2 divided by B2. And the second argument, which indicates how many digits we're rounding down to, would be zero. And then you see that the number of full-size teams is six. If you don't trust Excel like I do, uh, let's confirm the calculations by dividing the cell A2 by B2 without using any formulas and you see that the number here that was calculated is 6.5714 and the full number is 6 which meets our criteria for original question. Do you have a better solution? Please make sure your version and rationale in comments. In this section we will look at the logical reasoning questions that are used to evaluate candidates ability to reason and draw logical conclusions from the information given. The questions on this type of test typically involve sequences of shapes and numbers, analogies, and deductive reasoning questions. Let's look at some simple logical reasoning assessment test questions to get you prepared. Here's a puzzling question for you, but I have full confidence that you can solve it quickly. You're presented with 4x4 four four matrix, and the numbers are starting in the upper left corner, 9, 8, 3, 4. The second row numbers are 2, 9, 2 and then comes the missing number. The third row starts with 4, 6, 2, 0. And last but not least row is 7, 6, 2 and 6. You need to calculate the missing number. And you have four different choices to select from. Choice A, 2. Choice B, 5. Choice C, 6. And last but not least, choice D, 7. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. Did you get to the right answer? I hope you did, because I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. You're probably tired of hearing this on this channel, but to solve these types of challenges, you need to detect the pattern. And the pattern here is that the last two digits are equal to the sum of the first two digits multiplied by 2. Let's look at the example. The first row contains numbers 9, 8, 3, 4. And the expression here is that 9 plus 8 in parentheses multiplied by 2 equals 34. Based on this logic, the third number would be 4 plus 6 in parentheses multiplied by 2, which would be equal to 20, which represents the set of numbers 4, 6, and then 20. And then the last row would be 7 plus 6 in parentheses multiplied by 2, which would be 13 multiplied by 2, which would be equal to 26. So the missing number would be calculated as 2 plus 9 multiplied by 2 equals 22. So the correct answer here is choice A, 2. Did you get to the same answer? If you didn't, or maybe you got to a different answer, please make sure to post your version in comments. Here's a tricky problem, which some might find challenging, but you, being a subscriber to this channel, will solve very easily. You're presented with three expressions. Each expression is of a different color. And one of the items in the third expression, which represented by the blue color, is missing. You need to select the missing item, which is currently question mark, out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, C, and D. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Consider pausing this video to see if you need more time to find the solution. On my end, I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To solve any challenge, the key is to find the pattern. And this question is no exception. The pattern here is rather unusual, but it still exists. 
and the pattern here is that there are three core shapes represented by objects in the first column. The core objects here are arrow pointing up, star, and the circle. And all remaining objects are just the variations which is created by merging core objects into another object. Let me demonstrate by starting with the red sequence. A red sequence is created by starting with arrow, merging arrow with the star, and then merging the result with the circle. A yellow expression is created by starting with the star, merging it with the circle, and then merging the result with the arrow. And last but not least, blue sequence starts with the circle, completes the merger with the star, and then missing item can be created by doing another merger with the arrow. As you might have noticed, the objects here presented as expressions instead of being a sequence. There is no other reason to do it than just to confuse you. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please post your ideas, solution and rationale in comments. I love this challenge because it tests your analytical skills and spatial reasoning skills so well. You need to find the resulting shape after the transformations. You are presented with the square that consists of different triangles of a different color. And you need to turn the original shape 90 degree clockwise three times. You have four different choices to select the shape after the transformations. Choice A, B, C and D. Take a close look to see if you can calculate the final solution. Did you figure it out? Because I am moving forward to share with you my version and my way of solving it. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To solve this challenge, you need to mentally turn the original shape 90 degrees three times. This is not easy to do because our brain is not really designed for this. But if we take one of the triangles and try to follow this triangle by turning the original square, this task might be much easier to accomplish. The caveat here is that, that we need to select triangles that are not symmetrical on both sides. For example, red triangles are symmetrical. You see red triangles on the left and red triangles on the right. And if we try to follow it, it would be extremely hard to detect where the red triangle will end up. But if we take green triangles, any one of them, or yellow triangles, they're much easier to follow. So let's do the turning. Let's take the original square and I am going to follow the green triangle on the left. Let's do the first turn 90 degrees. You see that the green triangle ended up on the top. Let's do another turn. We follow the same green triangle and now it's on the right side. And the last 90 degree turn, our green triangle ended up at the bottom. So the correct choice here is choice A, where green triangle ended up on the bottom. Do you have a better way to solve it? Or maybe did you come up with a different solution? Please make sure to post your thoughts and rationale in comments. Here's a very interesting question which might make you think, but hopefully you will get it very quickly. If five people can sew five shirts in five minutes, how long will it take for 100 people to sew 100 shirts? You're presented with four different choices. Choice A, 500 minutes. Choice B, 100 minutes. Choice C, 5 minutes. And last but not least, choice D, 60 minutes. Take a close look, maybe pause this video to see if you can get to the right answer. And on my end, I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Here's the trick. If five people can sew five shirts in five minutes, we can say that one person can sew a shirt in five minutes. Now, if 100 people work together, their combined productivity will be 100 that of a one person. Because we can scale up so easily in this production, it will take 100 people 5 minutes to sew 100 shirts. So the correct answer here is choice C, 5 minutes. Did you get to the same answer? If you didn't, please make sure to share your answer and rationale in comments. I love this question because it is used very frequently to test your analytical skills and business math skills. You're presented with three expressions. The first expression is candy multiplied by sun equals 15. Second expression is candy plus 4 equals 9. And third and last expression is 12 equals sun multiplied by question mark. And you need to find this question mark and select out of four possible choices. Choice A, 2. Choice B, 3. Choice C, 4. And choice D, 5. Take a close look 
maybe pause this video to see if you can come up with the solution. Are you ready? I think you might benefit from a quick hint, and my hint to you would be, take a look at the middle expression. Are you ready now? Let's move forward, and I'll share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. This set of expressions looks unsolvable, but in reality, if we start with the middle expression, we can actually solve it. Let me demonstrate. Let's start with the expression candy plus 4 equals 9. Believe it or not, but we can actually calculate it. Candy would be equal 9 minus 4, and we can calculate the value for candy, which would be equal to 5. Now, knowing the value of candy, let's focus on the top expression. Candy plus sun equals 15. We know that the value of candy is 5, and when we substitute candy, it would be equal 5 multiplied by sun equals 15. So the calculated value for the sun would be 3. And now we can focus on the last expression. 12 equals sun multiplied by question mark. We know that the value of sun is 3, and we can substitute it, and the new expression will be 12 equals 3 multiplied by question mark. Question mark can be calculated by 12 divided by 4. So the end result would be answer C, 4. If you came up with the different answer, please post your answer and solution in comments. I enjoy solving pattern questions because they're so easy to understand, but sometimes not so easy to solve. We are presented with the sequence of numbers, and we need to find the missing number, which is the next in the sequence. The numbers are 25, 20, 16, 13, 11, and then comes the missing number. You need to calculate the missing number out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, C, and D. Choice A is 8, choice B is 10, choice C is 7, and choice D is 9. Take a close look to see if you can do the calculations and come up with the solution for the missing number. It looks confusing, isn't it? But believe me, there is a hope at the end of the tunnel. And I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Here, we have a concept of decrement. And the pattern is that the next number is calculated as previous number minus decrement. And decrement increases by 1 with each number in the sequence. Let's take a close look. Our first number in the sequence is 25. And our first initial decrement is minus 5. 25 minus 5 equals 20, and this is how we come to the second number. Then we decrease decrement by 1, and the decrement becomes minus 4. 20 minus 4 equals 16. 16 minus 3 equals 13. 13 minus 2 equals 11. And 11 minus 1 equals 10. So the correct answer here is choice B, 10. Was your answer different? Please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments then, so we can all learn. This is one of my favorite questions just because it's so unusual, but the answer here is very simple. You are presented with the set of 8 circles. 6 of the circles are visible, and you need to select 2 missing ones. You have 4 different choices to find the missing circles. Choices A, B, C, and D. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. Ready or not, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To answer this question, we need to detect the pattern. And the pattern here is very simple. Each circle is broken down into sections, with darker sections and lighter sections. And if you look closely, you will see that all circles are grouped in pairs. And the pattern is hidden in the sequence for circle pairs with each subsequent pair being similar to the previous one. Let's take a close look. To better understand the pattern, let's give each circle a unique number. If we start with the top row of circles, the numbers would be 1, 2, 3, 4, and the bottom row of circles will have numbers 5, 6, 7, and 8, with 7 and 8 being our missing pair. If you look closely at the circle 1, you will see that there is a dark section at the 2 o'clock. And circle 2 has two dark sections, one at noon and another one is at 2 o'clock. Similar pattern you see in circles 3 and 4. And then circles 5 and 6 also mimic the same pattern. Looking at possible answers, you see the choices A, B, C do not meet this pattern. And the only right answer that fits the pattern is choice D. Hopefully you've got to the same conclusion. 
And if you didn't, please make sure to post your answer and solution in comments. Here's the very interesting drum problem, which I have full confidence that you will solve very quickly. You're presented with three drums, and the next drum in the sequence is missing. You need to select the next drum out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, C, and D. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Did you figure it out? You would be surprised how simple the answer is. And that's why I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To solve this challenge, we need to understand the pattern. And the pattern will help us get to the correct solution. Even though drums and drumsticks look similar, this is not the case. If you look closely, you will see that only drumsticks are the same. But drums are different because they have dotted designs on each drum. Let me assign a unique number to each drum in the sequence. We will reference these drums as 1, 2, 3, and then the missing drum we will reference as number 4. Let's look closely at drum number 1. On the top of the drum 1, dotted pattern consists only of the white dots. But as it continues, you see different colors. Let's follow these colors. We have white, yellow, blue, pink, purple, and green. If we go to drum number two, you see that the dotted pattern shifts as it goes from left to right, and then this pattern restarts. For example, the last dot in the drum one is green, but then in drum two, this green dot restarts the pattern. To get to the correct answer, we need to continue shifting the pattern and get to the correct pattern for drum number four. And the correct pattern for drum number four will be pink, purple, green, white, yellow, and blue. And drum that matches this pattern will be choice C. Did you get to the correct solution? If not, please make sure to post your solution and rationale in comments. I love this question because it tests your spatial reasoning and analytical skills so well. You're presented with overlapping set of objects. We have in the picture pink square, red star, gray circle, yellow star, green circle, blue box, and pink diamond. In the middle of the picture, we have a gap where nothing is presented, and this gap is represented by the question mark. You need to fill the gap with one of four possible choices. Choices A, B, C, and D. Take a close look at the picture to see if you can fill the gap and find the missing object. I'm pretty sure you got it because I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. The correct answer here is choice C. Let's confirm and verify it by moving this choice to fill the gap. To solve these types of challenges, you need to mentally build the object in your head by continuing to visualize in your head one of the existing objects in the picture. I used green circle. It is very obvious which choice would continue the green circle. But you can also use yellow star, blue square, or pin square. Do you know any other ways how to solve these problems? Please make sure to post your ideas on how to better solve them in comments. Here's the very interesting question, which is frequently used to test your analytical reasoning and spatial reasoning. You are presented with the set of objects, and you need to find the missing item. The set of objects consists of three rows. In the first row, you see the pigeon, arrow, and then the pigeon again. In the second row, you see the flower, arrow, and then the flower again. Then in the third row, you see the car, the arrow, and then comes the missing item. You need to select the missing item out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, C, and D. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. If you can't figure it out, consider pausing this video to see if you can get to the answer. Are you ready? I am moving forward to share with you my version and my rationale for the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, or if you have a better explanation, please make sure to post in comments. The actual answer to the question is very simple, but the question was designed to confuse you. The objects that you see on the left of the arrow and on the right of the arrow are reflections of each other. What's interesting here is that the objects are mirror images reflected either horizontally or vertically. You determine the axis of reflection based not on the direction of the arrow, but based on the direction which is rotated 90 degrees to the direction actually shown. Let's look at the actual example. 
because the direction of the first arrow in the first row goes from top to bottom, the pigeon actually is reflected horizontally, not vertically. And to get to the correct answer, you need to rotate the pigeon 180 degrees. Let's look at the second object. We see the flowers with the yellow flower being on the left. And once we do the conversion, basically vertical reflection, because the arrow goes from left to right, we see that the yellow flower is now on the right. So the pattern here is that the arrow points to perpendicular direction of the actual reflection. For example, vertical direction of the arrow results in horizontal reflection and vice versa. Let's look at the third row to get to the correct answer. Because arrow goes from top to bottom, we need to use horizontal reflection. Which means that the correct answer here is choice A. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to post your answer and rationale in comments. In this section, we will look at Microsoft Word assessment test questions which evaluate candidates' proficiency and skills in using this widely used Microsoft Office application. Word Assessment Test aims to determine candidates' familiarity with the software itself, including its various features, tool, and formatting options. Let's look at some sample Microsoft Word Assessment Test questions we typically see on the test. Here's the thought-provoking assessment test question. In addition to boosting your reasoning skills, it teaches you the skill that you can use regularly. You need to gather the data and information from multiple different sources, like emails, web pages, spreadsheets, and documents. Which feature of Microsoft Word should you use to complete this task? And you're presented with five possible choices. Choice A, paste link. Choice B, paste special. Choice C, paste merged content. Choice D, paste multiple, and last but not least, choice E, paste append. Take a close look to see if you can recognize the right feature of Microsoft Word. Are you ready to uncover the mystery? Let's move on so I can share how I cracked the solution. And if you got a unique methods or better way, I'd love to hear it. Don't forget to share your approach in the comments below. Let's reveal the solution now. And as usual, to find the right solution, we will assess each answer choice that has been presented. Let's start with the first choice on the list. As you might have guessed, choice A, paste link, is incorrect. Paste link is used to insert a link to content copied from another location, not to collect the data and information from various sources. Choice B, paste special, is also incorrect. Paste special allows you to choose specific formatting or data types when pasting content, but it's not the appropriate feature to collect data from various sources. Both choices C, paste merged content, and choice E, paste append, are not correct options either. Both of them are not the standard features of Microsoft Word and are not relevant for collecting data from various sources. Which leads us to correct option, choice D, paste multiple items from clipboard. This is the correct option. Paste multiple items allows you to paste multiple pieces of content that has been copied to the clipboard making it an efficient way to collect the data and information from various sources. Let's look at how this feature works in details. For example, you might be working on the product catalog and your information is located in different sources, like this Word document, and some information might be stored in the email message you just received. You need to copy and paste multiple pieces of information into the product catalog Word file. To do this, let's check the clipboard settings by clicking on the Clipboard Details button. As you can see, there is nothing currently in the clipboard. Let's check the options on how we can collect the data. To do this, let's click on the Options button, and you see that the clipboard will collect without showing any Office clipboard. You can also choose options Show Office clipboard automatically, or Show Office clipboard when Ctrl-C pressed twice. Let's copy the product description from the Word file. To do this, let's select the description and click Copy. Now let's copy product image and dimensions from the email. To do this, let's select the image and click copy. Then let's select the dimensions and click copy again. Now it's time to come back to our Word document. We're back to the product catalog. And as you can see, there are three items in the clipboard now. We can paste them one by one. Let's put the cursor where the description is and select on the description to paste it. Now let's move to the dimensions section and we can paste the dimensions in here. 
And last but not least piece is the image. We put it as the first item in the product catalog. The only thing is left is to change how the image is shown. We click on the layout options and select the tight option for the text wrapping. Here's the very stimulating assessment test question. It boosts your analytical skills and enhances your ability to approach complex problems using Microsoft tools very effectively. You need to create a report by selecting specific short snippets of content from larger Microsoft Word document and adding them into the report. Which word feature is the most effective for this task? You're presented with five possible choices. Choice A, styles and headings. Choice B, navigation pane. Choice C, spike. Choice D, find and replace. And last but not least, choice E, table of content. Take a close look, analyze the question, and select your answer. Are you ready to compare solutions? Awesome! Let's now transition into revealing the answer. I'll share with you my take on the solution. And if you come up with the different or perhaps more efficient approach, feel free to drop it in comments below. Let's explore the solution together. To get to the correct answer, let's review each presented option individually. Let's start with the option A, styles and headings. As you might have guessed, this is an incorrect option. While styles and headings are useful for formatting and structuring a document, they don't involve selection and relocation of specific content, making them less effective for this particular task. For a very similar reasons, choice B, navigation pane, is also incorrect. The navigation pane is helpful for browsing and organizing the document, but unfortunately this option does not specifically involve cutting and pasting of selecting content, making it less suitable for the task described. Choice D, find and replace, is also incorrect. The find and replace option in Microsoft Word is used to search for specific text and replace it with other text, but this option does not involve the selection and relocation of content. And, as you might have guessed, choice E, table of content, is also incorrect. Table of content is a very useful feature in Microsoft Word, and it is used for creating an organized list of headings and subheadings in the document. But unfortunately, it is not intended for selecting and moving specific content within the document. Which leads us to choice C, spike, which I believe is correct. Spike is unknown feature in Microsoft Word, which represents a storage similar to clipboard. The storage is designed to cut multiple blocks of text or other content and paste them elsewhere in the document or into another Microsoft Word file. I think this is an efficient tool for selecting a specific content and organizing it within the report. Let's take a close look to see how Spike feature works. You are presented with the text that contains multiple paragraphs. You reviewed the text and you determined that selective sentences in this text a very good content for the future report. To select the text for the report, you need to select it and then click Ctrl F3. This cuts the text and puts it into the spike. Let's do it for a couple other sentences that might be useful for the report. We select the second sentence and click again Ctrl F3. And then another sentence and click Ctrl F3. Now let's switch to a new Microsoft Word document so we can paste the content. There are multiple ways to paste it. Let's go to Insert tab, then Navigate to Quick Parts, Auto Text, and this is where you see the content of the spike, and by clicking it, you will paste it directly into the new file. Let's undo this action, and I'll show you the quick shortcut that allows you to do the same thing. You can click Ctrl Shift F3, and it will paste the text directly by using the shortcut in the keyboard. So the correct answer here is choice C using spike feature of Microsoft Word. If you came up with the different or perhaps more efficient approach, feel free to drop it in comments so we can all learn. Let me share with you a tricky question we see on the test more and more often. To prepare a sample file for an employee training session, you need to generate unique text for each student in the class using Microsoft Word. What is the best way to do it? and you're presented with five different options. Choice A, use word formula. Choice B, copy and paste. Choice C, auto text and building blocks. Choice D, auto correct. And last but not least, choice E, mail merge. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the solution. Tricky question, don't you think so? Well, I think I know what my answer is going to be. So I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. 
And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments so we can all learn. To answer this question, let's analyze all the options to understand why they might be incorrect. Let's start by looking at option B, copy and paste. It is true that you can generate new text by copying content from another document or another source, for example, website or another Word document, and then pasting it into your Word document. You can use Ctrl C to copy and Ctrl V to paste. However, this option is not ideal for generating unique text for each student and may pose copyright issues. I think option C, auto text and building blocks, is also incorrect. Microsoft Word has a feature called auto text. It is also called building blocks in the new versions. And this feature allows you to store and insert frequently used text or context snippets with just a few clicks. While it can be convenient for inserting predefined text, it does not generate unique text for each student. Choice D, autocorrect, is also not a good choice. Autocorrect is the feature that corrects common misspellings and can be used to create shortcuts for longer phrases. But unfortunately, it does not generate unique text for each student. I think mail merge is also incorrect. Mail merge is useful for generating customized documents by merging data from spreadsheet or database into predefined templates. However, it's not suitable for generating unique text for each student for the training session. Which brings us to option A, use Word formula. Microsoft Word has a formula called RAND, and if you type it and hit enter, by default it will generate five paragraphs of three sentences each. This cool feature is also called placeholder text. The generated text is localized for your language selection. What's interesting is that the text is localized for your language selection on your computer. To customize your text, you type RAND and enter number of paragraphs and number of sentences, and then hit enter. For example, if you type RAND 7,5, it will generate the text for 7 paragraphs with 5 sentences each. You can also use a lorem function to generate non-localized pseudo-Latin text in Microsoft Word. What's amazing about this question is that you will not just learn the answer, but you will also learn about new features of the application. Here's the question. You're collaborating with colleagues to create the final version of Microsoft Word document. Multiple versions of text exist, and you want to preserve each version. Which Word feature is the most effective for this task? And you're presented with five possible choices. Choice A, File Properties. Choice B, Hide Text. Choice C, Document Comparison. Choice D, Comments. And last but not least, Choice E, Track Changes. Take a close look to see if you can answer this question. I think I know what my answer is going to be, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the solution. And obviously, if you have thoughts or different feedback or suggestions, please make sure to post them in comments. To get to the correct answer, let's analyze each option to determine if it is correct. Let's start by looking at choice A, File Properties. I think using the Properties features in Word, you can add version information, comments, or other metadata to the document's file properties. I think this is a helpful feature to manage different versions of the document, but it does not preserve the text itself. So I think this is an incorrect choice. Let's look at choice C, Document Comparison. I think this choice is also incorrect. Microsoft Word offers a built-in document comparison feature, which allows you to compare two versions of the document and highlight differences between them. While this is helpful for tracking changes, it doesn't directly preserve multiple versions of the text within the same document. I think choice D, comments, is also incorrect. You can insert comments at specific points in the document to provide feedback or suggestions. Comments serve as annotations but don't preserve distinct versions of the text itself. And I hope it doesn't come to you as a surprise that choice E, track changes, is also incorrect. This feature of Microsoft Word records edits made by collaborations and facilitates reviewing and accepting or rejecting changes. It does help with version control, but it does not inherently preserve multiple versions of the text for the future reference. This brings us to the answer of choice B, hide text. What's interesting, Microsoft Word allows you to hide the text, making it appear as if it isn't there while preserving it for the later use. This feature is very useful when you want to maintain different versions of content 
within the same document, and it also applies to images and embedded components. There is one limitation of this function, because it's available in Word on the desktop, but not in Word Online or Word apps for Android or iOS. Because hiding the text is such a useful feature, let's take a look how you can use it in more details. Let's assume that you're editing this text and you're not happy with the text in this paragraph. What you can do, you can select the text, click the details in the font section of the ribbon, and click hidden to hide this text. If you have the image in your text, you can hide it in the same way. You just select the text and the image, or just the image, navigate to the font properties section, and click hidden. To unhide it, you follow the opposite steps. Click on the properties. To view hidden text, you click on the show hide button in the ribbon. As you can see, the text that we hide is underlined with the dotted line. This is the example of the hidden text, as well as this is also an example of the hidden text with the image. What's cool is that you can use Word's Find and Replace option to search for the hidden text. You click on the Replace button, and then you click on More. Here, in Format section, you select the font, and here you select Find Hidden Text. Then you click Find Next, and Word keeps searching for the hidden text. What's cool is that Word also allows you to delete all hidden text at once, for example, before you send out the final version of the document. To do this, you navigate to the file, Info, and then check for Issues, and select Inspect Document. Here in the section, you can specifically select items you're looking for, but also focus on the hidden text, which would inspect the document for the text that has been formatted as hidden. So I believe the correct answer here is choice B, Hide Text. In cases where you need to track changes, obtain feedback, or manage versions, features like track changes or comments may be more appropriate. But in this particular case, for maintaining different versions within a single document, while keeping them hidden until needed, high text is a very cool and effective option. Do you disagree? If you do, please make sure to share your thoughts, solution, and rationale in comments. Let's dive into this captivating assessment test question. By working through this, you will improve your ability to think logically and make sound decisions in Microsoft Word. As a marketing manager for United States-based company, you are customizing Microsoft Word-based catalog for European distribution. What is the most efficient way to convert units of measure, like inches, pounds, and others, to the metric format in Microsoft Word? You're presented with five possible answers. Choice A. Formulas. Choice B. Using functions. Choice C, using autocorrect. Choice D, equations. And last but not least, choice E, cross-reference. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. Let's go ahead and transition into showcasing the solution. I'm about to share how I approach the question. And if you got the better methods or maybe brilliant alternative, make sure to share it in comments. Let's examine each provided answer option to identify the accurate solution. Let's start with the option A. I think formulas are used for mathematical calculations, but they are not the most efficient way to convert units of measure to the metric format in Microsoft Word. In fact, formulas typically involve arithmetic operations and are not designed for unit conversion. Choice B, function, is also incorrect. The term function in this context is vague and doesn't directly relate to converting units of measure to the metric format. It does not align with the most efficient methods for this specific task. I think choice D, equation, is also incorrect. Equations in Microsoft Word are used for mathematical or algebraic expressions. While they can handle unit conversions theoretically, they are not designed for the specific tasks of converting units of measure to the metric format. And I hope you're not surprised that choice E, cross-reference, is also incorrect. Cross-referencing is a tool used to link and refer to specific content within the document, such as figures, tables, or headings. It is unrelated to converting units of measure to the metric format. This analysis leads us to choice C, autocorrect. Microsoft Word's autocorrect feature can be used to automatically correct and replace predefined abbreviations or symbols with their corresponding metric units. This is extremely efficient way to convert units of measure to the metric format. To access Measurement Converter, you need to navigate to Word Options and then click on Proofing. Here, you need to click on Autocorrect Options and navigate to Actions. 
Once you click OK on all of these changes and then select the dimensions 5 inches, additional menu item becomes available, which is represented by additional actions. So now you can convert 5 inches into 12.7 centimeters. Similar functionality becomes available on the weight category. You select 0.37 pounds, navigate to additional actions, and you can convert them to 0.17 kilograms. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate you for helping us to become one of the largest YouTube channels to help people become smarter, increase your IQ, and to pass any test. If the content of this video was helpful, please make sure to click the like button to help YouTube algorithm promote this video and help other people to find it faster. Giving us a like is also a way for you to tell us that you need more content like this, and when you tell us, we will deliver it for you in the future. For links to free and premium resources, please check the description and comments of this video. You can also go directly to our website, howtoanalyzedata.net, to download the materials related to this topic. I really appreciate your endorsement, support, and patronage of this channel. And thank you for considering to become a member and considering to subscribe. Please leave feedback, suggestions, or corrections in comments. And all the best on your journey. I'll see you in my next video.